Deb, when you get a chance, would you let us know what other sponsors are here and we can do we can do the same thing we're doing with Senator Diamond? My bills can go last. I'm going to be here all morning, obviously. So. Okay. <clears throat> um, Representative Andrews is here. Great. S Senator DeChambeau, how do you feel about after Senator Diamond's bill, LD877, we take Representative Andrews' bill, LD1016. And Representative Moriarty is also here. And then take Representative Moriarty's bill, LD1021, and then we'll do my two bills. Okay, I'm all set with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right. Are we all set, uh, Ms. Fay? Yes. Thank you. Well, good morning, folks. Today is uh, Monday, April 5th, oh, and oh, this oh. is a meeting of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I am um, Susan DeChambeau, uh, Senate Chair, and I will have um, the other members of the committee introduce themselves, um, starting with um, my co-chair, um, Representative Warren. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charlotte Warren, and I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of West Gardner and Manchester. Thank you. I will then recognize Representative Reckett. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Lois Reckett, and I represent uh, the ocean end of South Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Senator Stairway, I skipped you. I'll uh, Senator Stairway. Yes, good morning. I'm Senator Scott Searway, and I represent District 16, which covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, Clinton, and Unity Township. Thank you. Representative Pickett. Good morning. My name is Dick Pickett. I represent House District 116 over in the beautiful white mountain foothills of Maine, towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. Thank you. Representative Costain. Good morning, uh, Dan Costain, District 100, which is part of Etna, Dixmont, Newport, Plymouth, and Corinna. Representative Morales. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Morales, and I represent um, House District 33 in South Portland, uh, the side, uh, not the ocean side, but the mall side. <laughs> um, Representative Pluker. Good morning. I represent House District 95, which is Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. Thank you. Representative Renicki. Good morning. I'm Shelley Rudnicki. I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield. And I just want to say that I am here at the Capitol, but under protest because we misrepresented to the main people that we were um, that we were done our business by adjourning sign die on uh, Tuesday. So I am here under protest. Our work should have been done before we did that. Thank you. Representative Luckner. Morning, I'm Grayson Luckner in Portland, District 37, neighborhoods of Strawwater, Libbytown, Rosemont, and Nason's Corner. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to also recognize our policy analyst, Jane Orbiton. Hi, Jane. And our committee clerk, uh, Deb Fahey, um, is with us. Um, I'd like the public to know also um, in her square, um, we'll always see the name, the number of the LD we're um, working on. <laughs> you look like Vanna White, Deb, when you did that, um, and that's that's so you can follow that also. So again, uh, thank you. As I said, um, I am Senator. Susan DeChambeau, my towns are Dayton, Lyman, Alfred, Arundel, Kennebunkport, and my 
little hometown of, uh, or it's a city, Biddeford. Thank you. So this morning um, we have, one, well, this morning we have five um, public hearings, new bills that we'll be hearing for the first time. And this afternoon we have three more. Um, the way we proceed is I will recognize the sponsor of the bill uh, who will present testimony and uh, the members can ask a few questions followed by any other legislator in the room that wishes to speak on that bill. Anyone in um, the waiting room, uh, we will welcome you. We will proceed all those in support of the bill to offer testimony, followed by those in opposition and those neither for nor against. So we will begin, if I not let anything missed uh, here around here. Um, so we begin with LD 877, an act to expand the definition of unlawful sexual touching. And our uh, sponsor is uh, Senator Dynan. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Senator DeChambeau. And Representative Warren and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am uh, Bill Diamond, Senate District 26. I live in Windham and my town, towns and district represent, uh, circles the Bagel Lake. Um, thank you again for all you do. Uh, I think you have the most unique committee in the legislature and you have to deal with uh, some of the most difficult issues. So thank you for that. I appreciate everything you folks do. I am here uh, as a proud sponsor of LD 877, an act to expand the definition of unlawful uh, sexual touching. Um, one of the problems uh, that we find with un unlawful sexual touching or groping uh, is that unfortunately, uh, groping has not been brought, kept at the forefront the way it should, have been, should be. Um, Criminal groping, as, as, as stated in our statute, is unwanted touching, feeling, rubbing. And unfortunately, again, that's no matter who receives that unwanted uh, grope, uh, women tend to be the most predominant victims. Uh, and I think part of our problem, part of our charge is to keep this issue before the public, uh, before legislature and um, people who are policy makers. And we've come a long way over the years for sure. Um, but I think we have a long way to go. And I think, again, um, we have to focus on education. I think we have to educate our young people. We have to educate uh, our older people. I mean, people need to understand that this is not something that it is, is acceptable. And uh, so I think we have a long way to go, uh, but we've come a long way. I, I recognize that. Uh, some of the terms that uh, in my research um, that you have probably heard in your capacities uh, such as Eve teasing and Chacon, depending which part of the world you're in. Um, the Eve teasing is a euphemism, as you probably know, of men assaulting women and girls. Uh, and it should be noted that the National Commission for Women are suggesting that that term be, uh, be changed because it may not be as appropriate. But the reason I bring it up is because that may be a term that you've heard. And I wanted to make sure it was at least part of your thought process. Um, that whole thing of the Eve teasing thing, which maybe is the most disgusting, is that that, that has been uh, labeled as people who use that uh, as the old terms of she was asking for it, which is horrendous in itself. But I think that's, again, part of the growth that we've seen, but we have a lot a long further to go. The Chikan is, is uh, in uh, Asian countries, Japan in particular, uh, it's a catch-all term uh, for sexual assault, including surreptitious cell phone photography. Um, and at one point, the Japanese the government has the scourge, has stated the scourge of groping uh, has gotten so bad. Uh, and this was a few years ago, especially on public transportation, the metro and the trains, uh, that they were they at one point uh, reserve cars, some cars just for women, females, so that to try to reduce uh, the groping problem. Um, all states have groping laws. Uh, the two weakest uh, are Idaho and Mississippi. Um, 
the Center for Investigating Reporting uh, tells us that Mississippi, for example, doesn't even mention the words sexual or touching or groping in their laws. So it's, it seems like a feeble attempt um, in some states. I think Maine is much farther ahead than that, obviously. And the other issue we have to deal with is at the federal level, there are no federal laws against groping, again, according to the Center for Investigating Reporting. LD-877, uh, the definition of sexual touching in, in the statute that's referenced, current definition is sexual touching means the touching of the breasts, buttocks, groin, or inner thigh directly or through clothing for the purpose of arousing or gratifying sexual desire. And this bill will add the words uh, kissing on the mouth. Uh, I, I would argue that that's just as, uh, as much of a violation it would be touching other parts of the body if it's unwanted. Uh, so I, I think that uh, some may say that um, it's already, somehow it's already inferred in the statutes. That may be, that's for you to decide. But if nothing else, I think if we have a chance to make it more clear and if nothing else, we can use this bill as, as, an, as an advertising or an awareness building or an education piece, then it served my purpose. So I, I would say one more thing about that is that again, I'm afraid, I'm concerned that a lot of people, a lot of victims uh, stay silent. And if we can make this more prominently uh, with support and talk about things that may not quite be explicit in the statutes by adding them, then I think we've done a service. So Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. That's my testimony and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Dill. Listen, I, Senator Diamond. Um, please, please. I, uh, anybody have any questions for Senator Diamond about this? Uh, Representative Kostain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I assume it doesn't say anything here about uh, unwanted on this uh, section G of the bill. I would only assume, and maybe Jane can help us, does it talk about that prior to in the statute, Jane, or, or Senator, either one? I would respond that, that unwanted is always part of the criminal definition. Um, where it's actually located, probably Jane could find that, but I, I, I'm quite confident that that's what the, the unwanted is, is part of that definition. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Um, Senator, I, I must have heard this maybe a clack, but I wrote down, is that, a, where did I write? I'm not sure where I got the information. Uh, is that a class D crime? Is that, this, is that part of your thinking? This doesn't change, this doesn't change the class. It simply adds, adds the words kissing on the mouth or, and that's, that's as far as it goes. So it's not an attempt to change a, a, change a class here. Okay, then I, I'll make my question a little clearer. What is, what we're looking at is really the definitions, adding that to the definition to G. Yes. And anybody who has their vertigo book, it's on page 46 on the top. Um, but then I'm looking at where the class is and I am wondering if that goes into 255, which is unlawful sexual contact. Um, and that's where it's a class G. Okay, I see Jane's hand and she can direct me. Thank you. Um, this definition in section 251 is of sexual touching. Yes. So if you go to section 260 on Fertico page 55, there is the crime of unlawful sexual touching. Okay, I missed that one. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. Um, Representative Reckett. Ooh. 
Uh, now I have two questions. Jane, what is the class of the crime on page 55? D. D, okay. Um, well, you asked Jane, I'm sorry. Let's no, that's fine. Anyway, um, but my original question was, you mentioned something, Senator Diamond, in your um, testimony about uh, training old people or something like that. Um, could you elaborate on what you were thinking? I mean, I'm thinking about the fact that people, yeah, anyway, would you elaborate on what you were thinking about? Sure, thank you. Um, I was simply, because I had referenced just before that we need to educate our younger people so they mm -hmm. can get first, and I didn't want to exclude any any level of age. I think it should be uh, the el not elderly, elderly, but we, people need to know that of all ages and all age brackets that this is uh, something that's not acceptable. And that we need, I think the more education we can provide, the better off we'll be and the fewer, hopefully the fewer victims uh, that, will, that will have to experience this. Thank you. Any other questions for Senator Diamond? Hearing none, I will then ask, does anyone, is there a legislator here that wishes to speak on this uh, bill? Seeing none, anyone wishing to uh, offer testimony in support of LD 877? Seeing none, anyone opposed to LD um, 877? Um, I, is there, uh, Ms. Fahey, is there anyone in the waiting room that wish to speak. Uh, if anyone is listening, you can raise your hand. And um, Ms. Saxel, you are here. Welcome, first time I see you. Um, do you wish to speak? And in, fa in favor, Madam Chair. In favor, okay, go right ahead, thank you. Madam Chair, Chairs, member of the committee. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Ward Sachs. I'm here on behalf of Maine Sexual Assault Support Centers in favor of LD 877. In 1999, I began my work as Mikasa's executive director and still remember the first call I received from a survivor seeking policy change. She told me a man had repeatedly and aggressively groped her breasts. She went to report the sexual assault to the police and they indicated it wasn't a sexual assault, but was an assault under the criminal code and that they could charge him with assault. She spoke to me about feeling betrayed by the law. She recognized that there was a very different kind of intent and impact of having your arm grabbed than having your breast groped. It was a very different kind of violation. The man in, uh, involved had a sexual intent and, and she felt sexually violated and feared additional sexual violence. It took four years, but now the sex crime statutes include unlawful sexual touching, which means touching, as you've heard, the breast, buttocks, groin, or inner thigh directly or through clothing for the purpose of arousing or gratifying sexual desire. Though I'm an admirer of CLAC and are grateful for their careful analysis, we do not always agree. And today is one of those days. They have a mantra that you have all heard before. We don't need a change if it can be prosecuted under current statute. They are right so many times, but today I would argue they are wrong. Uh, unless, I would add that unless the current statute does not reflect the nature of the crime, and that is the case here. When I spoke with the directors of Maine Sexual Assault Support Centers about this bill, they pointed out that a person forcing themselves on another person and kissing them is more intimate and threatening because of the necessity of close proximity, even more so than the touching of the inner thigh or buttocks from a distance, which currently constitutes unlawful sexual touching, which has both D and E versions if you go through the whole statute. I know that was one of your questions. I know some may say, we're gonna criminalize kissing now, but we're not asking anyone to criminalize kissing, but to ensure that the full scope of behaviors which constitute unlawful sexualized touching are represented within the law. As you will likely hear from CLAC, can already be prosecuted, but we would add not in a way that reflects the nature of the assault and that deeply impacts a survivor's experience and access to justice. Also, I wanna make sure that you know that unlawful sexual touching crimes are not registrable under the sex offender registry. That would remain true if kissing were added to the statute 
it would not be registrable. Thank you for your time and consideration. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your education. It's um, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ward Saxel, for being here. Um, so I have a couple questions because I'm trying to sort of square the issues that you brought up, um, specifically around, you know, Clack saying we don't need another, you know, crime if we can already prosecute something. So I also subscribe to that theory. And I want to add in another theory um, that I try to subscribe to, which is we don't use the criminal code to send a message. So how, but you're, you're pulling me closer to your position by sharing that survivors have said to you, this is much more intimate of an assault, et cetera. Um, so are these cases able to be prosecuted currently or no, because it's not in the statute? Oh, no, I, th I think they are able to be prosecuted under the assault statute. Yeah, and, and I think, um, as I said, um, you know, it just represents a very different impact on the victim, and I would argue intent of the person committing the crime, that it is of a sexualized nature, and thus, um, you know, creates different kinds of trauma, different kinds of uh, response, uh, you know, from the individual than, than sort of the typical simple assault would create. And so for me, this just puts kissing into the right category of assault, sort of closes out that unlawful sexual touching category of crimes that have a, have a particular kind of an intent. And, and of course, it's, it's, it creates a, an additional barrier, frankly, for, for prosecuting this because you have to improve, improve that sexualized intent, right? So it actually, you know, there, there's a reason why you might not prosecute under this, but, but folks um, as survivors really want to have that, um, that sexualized nature of the kind of crime recognized within the code. Thank you for that. Anyone else um, have a question for Ms. Saxon? Seeing none, thank you. thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I see that in the room, thank you. Hi, Mr. Sa I, I wanna say it right, Sabak, Sabak. Sarbak, you got it right. I said it right the first time, okay. Welcome, uh, you wish to provide testimony? I do. Thank you, uh, Senator Dushimbo, Representative Warren, members of the committee. Um, I'm also here. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm Jonathan Sarbeck. I'm the district attorney in Cumberland County. I live in Cape Elizabeth, and I'm here in support of LD 877. Uh, one of the main reasons I'm here is uh, for similar reasons as uh, Ms. Ward Saxel just uh, pointed out with regards to the specific nature um, that 877 would provide to the unlawful sexual touching definition. Um, that is a key part of why I support this, and I understand the, the thoughts of, um, of CLAC with regards to that it, this type of conduct could already be um, used under the assault statute as offensive touching. Uh, however, uh, for the same reasons that Ms. Ward Saxel just pointed out, is that when there is unwanted kissing, uh, there is a sexualized nature of that. And I think that this change in the definition would actually define that much more um, definitively in a way that's going to reflect uh, what the criminal statute uh, would provide with regards to the behavior uh, that would go along with that. Uh, that's helpful as a prosecutor for one, uh, charging something that is more specific to the actual crime that's committed. Uh, as we know, assault can be somebody hitting somebody at a bar or it could be somebody uh, giving somebody an unwanted kiss that they didn't want. Uh, when we look at a statute, when we look at a criminal history, especially, uh, we wanna know exactly what happened in that instance uh, by looking at the charge. If you see an assault on somebody's record, uh, you probably wouldn't know whether or not that contained um, a sexualized uh, a 
type of assault or just a, a physical type of assault. You have to look into the specifics. So really kind of understanding what go, goes along with the charge can be very helpful. Uh, I've had situations in the past where this type of conduct um, has occurred and I've had to tell victims that, that the only thing that we can charge uh, is an assault and we can make sentencing arguments with regards to that. Uh, however, for a future prosecutor to look at that criminal history, uh, they're not going to know what the actual uh, event that happened. Uh, if the definition was changed, I think that it would um, better reflect the conduct uh, that's being alleged here. So that is why uh, myself as a district attorney in Cumberland County would be in support of LD 877. And I would be happy to answer any questions that people might have. Thank you. Representative Fluka. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could you just let me know, offensive touching, is that also a class D crime? Yes, it's an assault. So the, the, um, <clears throat> the sentence would be very similar if it were a sexual um, touching versus an offensive touching? I couldn't tell you what the actual sentence would be. Those go usually on a case by case basis and the court is the one who uh, sentences ultimately. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you, yes, um, there is, uh, this would be one sentence or the other. Uh, there's no mandatory minimum on either besides a fine on an assault charge. Um, but there's nothing that dictates what the sentence has to be in, in either charge. So just one follow up, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. So what you're arguing, the significance of having it being sexual touching versus offensive touching is just for, so that when you're looking back in a historical record, it's clearer what happened. It could be helpful, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to ask questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Um, anyone else wish to uh, offer testimony in support? I don't see anyone and I will recognize anyone wishing to speak in opposition. And I have, I'm told, um, uh, Walter McKee and also a representative from CLAC, uh, John Pelletier, if you're here, you may enter the room. Um, welcome, Mr. McKee. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Shembo, Representative Warren, and members of the Joint uh, Committee. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Maine Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in opposition to LD 877. A little bit of my thunder has been taken care of uh, or taken up by the proponents of the bill, uh, ironically, because there's a specific and definitive recognition uh, that this crime that's being created by this new definition is in fact already a crime. It's a class D crime punishable by the identical uh, sentence if this uh, statute was changed to up to 364 days in jail and a significant fine. I think it's important to recognize that courts don't see every single assault case as just a quote, simple assault. Sentencing is a unique process <clears throat> set at time and again. Judges uh, listen to the facts and circumstances and can, and I would respectfully suggest would, take into account an assault that was a, uh, an unwanted kissing very different than somebody who pushed somebody or who was in a bar fight. The intimacy uh, of that act, I agree, is significant and it's something that a court can right now and would take into account on a prosecution for assault. I certainly appreciate that more education, more awareness um, are important uh, goals uh, for us to bring this issue forward that people can be kissed when they don't want to be and it's a crime uh, that could send a message by changing the statute but there's no need to do that because we already have one in place. I appreciate that right now, the, uh, the crime of a lawful sexual touching is not a registrable offense, but what, certainly what we've discovered over the last 10 years is that more and more, every single session it appears, I don't think it's happened in the recent session, more and more crimes are characterized uh, and as placeable on the registry, and it says a potential of expanding the registry. And lastly, I think I appreciate uh, District Attorney Starbeck's comments about the historical record but the historical record doesn't exist in the, uh, you know, the absolute, it's just an assault. All those records are freely and fully available to every single law enforcement officer and district attorney. So if they wanna know about what the nature was of the prior assault, they can simply pull the records and that's something that's not too difficult for them to do. In fact, they, always, they often do that and especially so in sentencing. 
So in sum, we're dealing with a statute that already criminalizes this very conduct, a situation where a judge can take into account the specific nature of the conduct in sentencing to give a more enhanced sentence. Uh, and though I appreciate that there's more education and about this, I would suggest that unwanted kissing as it stands right now, everyone knows whether you're young or you're old, you can't do it and it can be a crime. And in fact, in Maine, if you do it, it will be a crime, a class D crime of assault. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I'm gonna ask you, Mr. McKee, um, you know, unwanted um, little children, there must be another crime then if it's children, um, let's say under the age of four and they can't say no, everybody's kissing them. Uh, and, um, an uncle kisses because he may have a track record with young children. Um, what crime is that? If uh, Is it because of the age of the child and can't acquiesce or what? No, uh, the implied acquiescence or the act with the, um, if you're indicating this is not something that was unwanted, um, as it is this offensive in and of itself, whether the child can testify or not, that's no different than any other assault, which would be the offensive physical contact. So it's a class D crime across the board. In certain crimes involving assaults of children, they can be felonies, but they wouldn't be in a situation like this where there was no bodily injury. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any questions for Mr. McKee? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank you. Um, I will recognize, I don't see him, uh, Mr. Pelletier, are you here? Or anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Welcome, Mr. Pelletier. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau and Representative Warren, members of the Criminal Justice Committee. My name is John Pelletier. I'm the chair of the Criminal Advisory Commission. And um, Mr. McKee said that his a lot of his thunder had already been stolen and uh, it, it's sort of the same way with me. I'll, I, I will say that, um, and, and, and echoing the, the, the point I'd like to focus on is echoing what Representative Warren had to say, is that we, it, there's a strong view in our group that the criminal code is not uh, a tool for education. People have a lot of tools uh, for education on different issues, but um, the, the criminal code is specifically designed to try and capture a full range of conduct with general language, like the assault statute, which is bodily injury or offensive physical contact. And under that offensive physical contact, you can imagine a myriad ways of causing that. And if we were to, to try and create a code where we went in and listed each individual way that you could cause an unlawful um, offensive physical contact, then you know the, the books wouldn't be big enough to hold uh, such a statute. And the the um, similarly, there are lots of things because criminals are good at or people who violate the law uh, are inventive, there are always new or different forms of law violations. And when something comes up and it's the, uh, the topic of the minute, you know, there's always an urge to, well, we wanna put this explicitly in the statute so people know about it. And, but again, if you go down that road, there really is no end to it. And, um, you know, so the, our group is, that's where we, that's where we come down. This conduct is already fully covered. It's covered at an appropriate classification and sentencing level. Uh, and we think that um, the, uh, the, the criminal additions to the criminal code for education purposes are, are really not warranted. So I'll leave it at that. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I have a Representative Pluker followed by Representative Pickett for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Peltzier, when would you say it's, it's beneficial to have access to the sexual touching 
definition in the in the criminal statute and be able to use that as opposed to using offensive touching. Um, well, I, I can't say that I recall, but the entire unlawful sexual touching statute really is covered by the generic assault statute. So, you know, as happens, uh, I suspect that at the time uh, that was the position of our, our, our board. I don't, I don't remember, but obviously it's the legislature's, uh, legislature's judgment and the legislature has, has, has made that judgment to create the unlawful sexual touching statute. Um, and I think looking at it from a, the broad perspective, uh, it's all assault. And of course, I'm not a prosecutor and I'm not a sexual assault victim advocate, but from my perspective, just on the legal analysis, um, it seems to me that the assault statute uh, is sufficient uh, for pretty much all of these touchings. Thank you very much. Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, John. <clears throat> I just have one, one question. I guess it would be, what do you say then when the statement was made, as you will likely hear from Clack, it can already be prosecuted, but we would add in the Last phrase is what I want to ask you about. Not a way that reflects the nature of the assault and that deeply impacts a survivor's experience and access to justice. Because well, it can already be dealt with, but how, how, what do you say to that last part? It's being dealt with, but not in a way that reflects the nature of the assault and deeply impacts a survivor's experience and access to justice. Well, these, these, are, these are questions that you're the policymakers and th these are questions that you'll have to wrestle with. But I think what I would say is that if you imagine the, the, the types of conduct that could come under, uh, could come under an assault statute, you know, you've got uh, jail guards, having feces thrown at them. You've got, uh, you know, you can think of, you know, and someone, uh, a person who is uh, perhaps uh, suffering a mental health episode and uh, completely unprovoked walks up to someone and punches them in the jaw. That has a profound impact on, on, on folks. And so, the, the question that's before the committee is, are you going to single out this impact or is it gonna be treated, is, is, the, is the remedy for the impact really going to be in the seriousness of the prosecutor when they move forward on the assault case, the way they present the, uh, the, way they present the sentencing argument or the plea discussion to uh, with respect to the case, and ultimately the outcome uh, in the court in addressing the, uh, the consequences that have befallen the victim in dealing with the, uh, with the criminal case at hand. You know, th those are other ways that it can be addressed. Thank you, John. I don't see anyone's hand up. So I thank you, Mr. Pelletier. I will ask if anyone else wish to speak um, in opposition. Seeing none. Anyone wish to offer testimony neither for nor against? Seeing none. I think we have ended uh, and we will close the public hearing on LD 877. Um, I don't have my calendar. Is um, Ms. Oberton, when will we have um, work session? Did, have we scheduled that? Yeah, all of these bills uh, that we're doing today, both morning and afternoon, are scheduled for work session next Monday, the 12th at 1 p.m. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Dinan. Okay. The next uh, bill we is a little bit out of order. The next two are 1016 and 1021. Uh, next 16, 1016. Is, uh, there he is, uh, Representative Andrews, welcome. The bill that we have before us is an act to ensure that assemblies, protests, and demonstrations in Maine remain peaceful. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have the sponsor here, Representative Andrews. Uh, again, welcome. And uh, could you present this bill to us, please? Thank you. Good morning, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and esteemed members of the Criminal Justice Committee. My name is John Andrews, and I represent District 73 in Western Maine. I am here today to present my bill, LB 1016, and I act to ensure that assemblies, protests, and demonstrations in Maine remain peaceful. We live in perilous times. In the past year, we have we have seen widespread rioting, destruction, and looting that has done damage to innocent citizens and businesses across the country. Every American has a First Amendment right to peaceably assemble and petition their government for redress of grievances. That is not up for debate. You have a fundamental right to protest, but you do not have a right to hurt people or break their stuff. This bill seeks to support that right by aiming to keep protests and assemblies peaceful in the Left, right, and everywhere in between has been a fault for escalating political violence in the past 24 months. That is a sad and scary fact. It is imperative that we must support the rule of law and strengthen it for good policy. As legislators, we must lead as we enact policy that can have a real world effect on real world situations for our state. We must be proactive and prepare for the worst as we hope for the best. The bill before you today aims to do just that. LD 1016 seeks to deter peaceful protests from escalating into political violence. The dictionary definition of terrorism is the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. That is why LD 1016 amends the definition of terroristic intent. There are criminal defense lawyers who will claim that this bill is unnecessary. They would be incorrect as evidenced by the events that we've seen in 2020 and 2021. Maine needs to be prepared for any unfortunate event that might happen and have our criminal code updated to reflect the trends that we are seeing across the country. Summer is quickly approaching and the last thing we need is summertime to be synonymous with riot season. LD 1016 can put a stop to that trend with your support. LD 1016 ensures that we can all exercise our first amendment rights while updating the criminal code to reflect this rise in political violence that our nation has seen. Serious times demand serious solutions, and this bill does just that. Maine has an opportunity to support the rule of law, law enforcement, civilians, and private property. I would urge you to vote auto pass so that Maine can lead the nation in enacting legislation that will help protests and assemblies remain peaceful. Thank you all for your time and your commitment to public service. Thank you. Uh <clears throat> Anyone wishing to ask a question of the sponsor, Representative Andrews? I have Representative Reckitt followed by Representative Luckner. I'm looking at the, uh, the statute in section 25. Um, I think it's part F, the things that you can't, uh, <clears throat> you can't do because they could produce death or serious bodily injury, like use fire, fireworks, combustible materials, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Where do guns fit into this? I would, I would absolutely include those if you're using them for the purpose of political violence to push a, a certain narrative or a view that you can't debate through using words and having dessert to using violence. A weapon's a weapon. Did you uh, not, ex if I could follow up? Yes, um, Do you, um, 
did you not include it explicitly for any particular reason? No, I think I was more focused on the improvised weapons that I had seen on the news, but I think you raise a valid point. Thank you. Uh, Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Andrews. Uh, is there anything in this bill that isn't already a crime uh, that could be prosecuted under another statute? I think it kind of speaks to intent. So a lot of these already do exist uh, as crimes, but if they're being used to push a political agenda, I think that kind of uh, makes it a different animal, so to speak. Good, yeah, thanks. Um, anyone else have any questions for Representative Andrews? Seeing none, um, um, Representative Reckitt, you, um, no, that's sorry. a whole hand, right? <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Andrews. Any yeah. representatives, any legislator wishing to speak on this bill? Please step forward. Anyone wishing to speak at all to this bill, I will now call those in opposition to this bill. Ms. Fahey, is anyone raising their hand um, that wish to just, come just in? Just a moment. There is Thank one. you. I think there's one more person who wanted to speak in favor. All right. Thank you. Mr. Cabetta, good morning. Uh, are you wishing to speak in favor or in opposition? In opposition. Okay. Mr. Koshaw, you wish to speak in favor? Richard Koshaw, we can't hear you. No, sorry. Mr. Koshaw, we, we can't hear you. No, if you can see me, I'm shaking my head. We can't hear you, I'm sorry. I'll have to move on if Mr. Koshar, I'll just skip over to the opposition and if uh, you can make it work, we'll get back to you. Um, Mr. Cabetta, uh, I will ask if there was no one else in support other than Mr. Koshar. So that uh, now in opposition and we have Mr. Cabetta. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Michael Cabetta, and I'm policy counsel for the ACLU of Maine. On behalf of our members, we urge you to oppose this bill because it is redundant and threatens our First Amendment right to protest. Representative Luckner just asked a simple question to which there is a simple answer. Yes, every act that would be covered by this bill, if it were to become a law, is already a crime. Assaulting federal officers is a crime. Assaulting state officers is a crime. Damaging federal property is a crime. Damaging state, private, or public property are crimes. Furthermore, a person can be charged with attempting, conspiring to attempt, uh, conspiring to commit, aiding and abetting, or becoming an accessory after the fact to any of these crimes. This bill addresses a problem that does not exist, and in doing so, creates its own problems. Because it would make a new offense out of things that are already crimes, it would allow the government to charge a person who commits property damage at a protest for two separate offenses and be punished twice for the same conduct in state court after which they could also be prosecuted in federal court and possibly also sued for civil damages. In the world that this bill would create, protesters would be penalized for the mere fact of engaging in the constitutionally protected activity of expressing one's views because the only distinguishing fact between a person who commits property damage at a protest and someone who does the same thing elsewhere would be the fact of attending a protest. Adding extra penalties against protesters 
could make them afraid to attend rallies, which is exactly the kind of chilling effect that the United States Supreme Court has recognized as dangerous and inconsistent with our fundamental freedoms. The right to freely speak and petition our government for a redress of grievances goes directly to the heart of what makes us who we are as a country. The American Civil Liberties Union was established over a century ago to counteract widespread government censorship of lawful protest. Since that time, the government has periodically responded to moments of great social change by criminalizing protest and protesters in an attempt to stop progress. As the Supreme Court has pointed out, even small encroachments on free speech can have broad reaching effects. We should not risk irreparable damage to our freedoms, especially to solve a non-existent problem. We urge the committee to vote ought not to pass. I uh, uh, thank you all for your time and attention and I'm happy to try to answer questions. Thank you. Um, any committee members have a question for Mr. Cabetta? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. And anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, yes, Mr. Pelletier. Yes, thank you, uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is John Pelletier. I'm chair of the Criminal Law Advisory Committee. Uh, I just want to uh, point out uh, that the, um, the definition of terroristic intent is narrow and applies in only a few instances. And the reason for that, well, I think the reason for that is tied to its origin. I was around then. This statute, uh, this definition was crafted after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And it was crafted for the purpose of putting something in statute in Maine that would allow the state to respond if Maine were the victim of a serious, substantial terrorist attack. And that was the aim. So terroristic intent is involved with only three crimes. It, it requires, currently requires injuries to multiple people, damage to multiple structures, critical infrastructure, and it involves the class A crime of elevated aggravated assault, the class B crime of aggravated reckless conduct, and the class A crime of causing a catastrophe. So what this uh, altering the definition would do would uh, create, take all of the items that are in the proposed language and convert them into class A and B crimes, simply if they were committed during or somehow associated with a, with a um, protest. And again, altering the definition, broadening it in this way would undermine the intent of the original statute as narrow and focused on serious uh, consequential terrorist attacks. And the members of uh, you know, the CLAC panel uh, were also concerned about the civil liberties uh, interests that you heard of, heard about from Mr. Cabetta. It's, it's unmistakable that the bill is associated at conduct that, uh, that is related in some way to people exercising their right to protest. Our members don't condone violence or damage during protests, but um, we just don't see this taking what is already criminal conduct and greatly uh, in many instances, increasing the classification of crimes, crime as the appropriate way to go. And finally, section two of the bill has the same, uh, the same uh, problems in that it, uh, it makes any willful destruction of private property a class B offense cut punishable by 10 years. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any members wish to ask questions of Mr. Pelletier? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Pelletier. I will now go back to uh, Mr. Kosha. You wish to speak uh, in favor? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. 
<clears throat> I am Richard Cachot from Bridgeton, Maine. I appreciate the honorable member of the members of the committee on the criminal justice and public safety to step back and let me testify in favor of this bill. <clears throat> I do not lightly suggest changes in the statutes of Maine, but I strongly believe this change is required to more accurately and specifically delineate the scope of the definition of the phrase terroristic intent to further protect public, private, property, law enforcement officers, or public servants. As many events in many other states have shown the past 24 months, these types of threats, and these behaviors and attempts to coerce or intimidate the citizens and the government have become commonplace. This should not be tolerated. By supporting this bill, we will further protect the state, its citizens, and other public and private property from terroristic violence by further delineation of these acts. I do not believe that these acts limit free speech as suggested earlier. I do not suggest that these acts are not illegal under other sections of the law, but I believe this is a further delineation which Maine needs in our statutes. So I strongly suggest the committee ought to pass on LD 1016. I appreciate your time. I'm Richard Cachot from Bridgeton, Maine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cocho. Anyone have a question for Mr. Cocho? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, I believe anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against um, this bill? Again, seeing none, I will close this uh, hearing on LD 1016 and um, we will have a work session next Monday, the 12th. Um, so, we will see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Ray. you, Representative. Okay. <clears throat> and yes, I forgot to mention we have a three minute clock um, with all the number of bills this <laughs> week, we will use it. Um, the next one, let me, I forgot is LD 1021, and this is a bill from Representative Moriarty, the name of which is an act to protect Maine residents from stalking by use of an unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, Mr. Um, uh, Representative Moriarty, are you with us? There you are. Thank you and welcome. Thanks very much. Okay, Mr. Moriarty, you may proceed. Thank you, Senator Deschambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the uh, Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. First of all, thanks for your courtesy in taking me uh, out of order. I appreciate that. Uh, the bill before you on your calendar this morning is, as you have just stated, uh, Madam Chair, uh, a bill that would uh, revise the current anti-stalking statute in the main criminal code, which is section 210-capital A. Um, a little bit of background. The reason for this bill originated from an incident that occurred a year ago, January in Gorham. And as reported in the Portland Press Herald, a woman was stalked by a drone on two consecutive nights, called the police on both occasions. The police responded and the officer could easily see the, the drone in the sky above the service station where the woman was located and essentially told her there's nothing much we could do about this. So that caught my attention and I submitted a late filed bill 
was given permission by the Legislative Council to introduce it. And ironically, it was set for hearing before you on March 18, the day after we adjourned last spring. <laughs> so I, uh, it never went anywhere. So I reoffered it uh, uh, this year. And when it uh, finally came out as an LD, um, I got some, uh, some feedback and input from two, two very important uh, organizations. First of all, from uh, uh, Mr. Pelletier's organization, CLAC. They indicated they could not support the bill and felt that the current statute adequately provided tools for dealing with uh, stalking, even though drones were not specifically uh, mentioned. And when I had that input, I realized I was on uh, thin ice. And then on Friday of this past week, I had a letter from uh, the Maine Prosecutors Association essentially expressing the same point of view that this was redundant, that there were in their judgment sufficient tools in the existing statute to deal with um, stalking by the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. And at that point, I knew that my goose was cooked. So you have, I believe, two letters from me before you. Now, ironically, they're both dated today's date. Um, they shouldn't have been. The, the older of the two should have been dated a week ago today, because that's when I submitted it to my aide, who in turn forwarded it to the committee. The more recent letter was sent out on Friday, after I had heard from District Attorney Megan Maloney indicating that her organization could not support the bill. Very helpfully, uh, District Attorney Todd Collins from Caribou suggested that the proper focus ought to be on the violation of privacy statute, which is section 511 of, of the criminal code, rather on the uh, stalking statute. And Mr. Collins also very kindly provided me with some language which would do the trick and fill in some uh, empty areas or areas of ambiguity which would make the right to privacy all the more precise or precisely defined and all the more tight. So I, 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 I'm hoping that you may have the second letter dated April 5 uh, before you. And uh, that's the one that mentions that these organizations had indicated that uh, uh, the anti-stalking bill was uh, unnecessary. And they indicated that I uh, proposed to basically uh, withdraw the text previously submitted to you and to substitute in its place uh, an amendment to uh, which, uh, which would amend uh, section 511 subparagraph C of Title 17A. And if you, it, it's, it's fairly short language. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you if that would be useful. And it reads as follows. Um, a violation of privacy would include uh, an instance in which one installs or uses outside a private place without the consent of the person or persons entitled to privacy therein, any device for hearing, uh, for observing, photographing, hearing, recording, amplifying or broadcasting sounds originating in that place that would, ordinar or that would not ordinarily be visible, audible or comprehensible outside that place. Now, since my letter was submitted on Friday afternoon uh, last week, late that afternoon, I had a further communication from District Attorney Collins suggesting that I add two more words to make it absolutely airtight. So where the language reads amplifying or broadcasting, he suggested, and I concur with his suggestion, that I include the words images or, and then sounds originating in that place and so forth and so on to the end of the printed language. So that the, as amended, uh, the new statute would uh, deal with um, not only recording sounds, but taking pictures and recording images 
of individuals in a private place, in a place where they had a reasonable expectation of privacy um, and broadcasting those images or sounds um, which would otherwise not be visible or observable to the public. So I realize this is a little unorthodox and uh, possibly even a little annoying on my part to withdraw the text that I had submitted to you and to substitute a new text altogether. I will say that it's brief and to the point, it's not lengthy. It deals with an existing statute and does not substitute a new one in its place. Um, but in my judgment and in the judgment of some uh, folks who will follow me, this does uh, uh, enhance the scope and the clarity of the uh, violation of privacy statute. That coupled with the recognition from the law enforcement community that stalking by drone is already covered by the existing statute and doesn't need to be tailored with in any respect satisfies me and I hope satisfies you as well. And we can do, uh, and, and we can do take a step to, to really tighten up the right to privacy in an era in which privacy is, uh, is, is uh, under, not under threat, but can be invaded in ways and by means that were not foreseeable 10 to 15 years ago and longer ago than that. So I appreciate your attention this morning I'm happy to answer any questions and apologize for the confusion that the uh, items of correspondence uh, may have caused. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Moriarty. You were very clear and I enjoyed your presentation. I, I do want to ask you, however, I missed the statute. Uh, would you please give me that again, please? Yes, so it's, can... it's a, again, we're in Title 17A, yeah. uh, Section 511. Okay. The paragraph one, capital letter C. Good. Great. Thank you. Sure. I may use this for another problem I have with a constituent. So thank you. <laughs> Good. Glad um, to help. <laughs> anyone wishing to speak in support? Uh, and I see Senator Sitway. Oh, I ask. Excuse me. I, I'm completely lost now. Uh, sorry, Senator Stateway. Uh You have a question for Mr. Moriarty? Yes, yes. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Mor Moriarty. Good morning, Senator. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate you bringing this forward. I think that uh, it is a, a new and a new age uh, problem that we're going to be seeing more of. Um, I just uh, want to know how uh, how does these drones, how would they be able to get that privacy sound and, and video if it's in a private area? I mean, I'm just kind of trying to visualize, you know, a drone up in the air and somebody in their home. Sure, or whatever. That's, so that's the question I have. Yep, of course. Uh, very, very good question. Uh, this would basically protect someone who's sitting on their deck, on their porch, or frankly, even inside their living room and the drone is hovering outside the window. Um, there's no limit to which a drone can descend uh, below the maximum height of 400 feet. And um, so we, you know, we all use our backyards and our decks and so forth, and, and we're all sitting behind windows at one time or another. And that's how they could actually take images uh, where you as the homeowner or the resident would have a full expectation of privacy and never imagine that there's something out there taking your picture, recording your image and recording sound at the same time. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, I... You know, I have huge windows and a lot of people do now in their homes and sure. it's uh, very easy to to do. So I just was just wondering a little clarity on that. Thank you. Very welcome. Anyone, any member wish to have, a, wish to ask a question of Representative Moriarty? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Mori uh, Representative Moriarty. Thank I you. Glad will to be here. ask 
if any legislator is present that wish to speak in um, regarding this uh, testimony. Seeing none, anyone uh, wish to speak in favor of this proposed bill? I would presume, Ms. Fahey, uh, if we have anybody out there, um, I am still in the area of speaking in favor. Megan Maloney is in the room. Yeah, are you in favor, Ms. Maloney? Thank you. Go yes, right ahead. Amen. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Megan Maloney. I'm the District Attorney for Kennebec and Somerset Counties and President of the Maine Prosecutors Association. I'm submitting this testimony on behalf of the MPA's unanimous support of LD 1021 as amended. Privacy is so important to Maine people and yet it is becoming easier and easier to invade. This bill takes a small step towards giving more privacy to the people of Maine. Instead of doing so in the stalking statute, it does, it does so through an expansion of the violation of privacy statute. A statute that criminalizes a violation of privacy but doesn't include drones is not acknowledging the world in which we live. LD 1021 amends 17A main revised statutes section 511C violation of privacy by adding the words observing, photographing, images or, and visible um, as I put in my submitted written testimony. I underlined those words in this and place them in the statute. The statute defines private place as a place where one may reasonably expect to be safe from surveillance, including, but not limited to, changing or dressing rooms, bathrooms, and similar places. And violation of this statute is a class D misdemeanor. So we urge you to vote in favor of LD 1021 as amended. And we really appreciate Representative Moriarty uh, taking the time to to change the statute and to really work with us uh, so it can be something that will be of great benefit to the main people. So thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Maloney? Uh, Representative Morales. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it's good to see you, Ms. Maloney. Thank you so much for that. I just had a thought. Um, I'm wondering, um, and I, I'm trying to on my phone access 511 too, as as I'm hearing about it. Um, wondering if the because I I have researched FAA regulations as well, um, and there just are none um, that really would protect folks. Um, so I I hear that, um, and I'm wondering about this particular statute in 511 if it also prohibits um, the government from using drones without a warrant. Or what, what protections do folks have for that scenario? I, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I don't think it relates specifically to the government uh, because it's, I mean, in general, if the government is going to um, invade someone's privacy, they can't do so without a warrant. Right. They have to have probable cause. They have to um, write it down, have prosecution review it, have a judge review it and sign it. And then they're allowed to do what we can't do. Um, so I don't, I don't know that this would, I mean, maybe, you know, I'm going to have to think about that because maybe it would in some way impact the government's uh, need, cause them to have a greater need to uh, get a warrant in a situation, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe a drone in someone's backyard looking for um, marijuana plants or something of that nature. Um, I, I will look into that and, and get you a full answer for the work session. It's a great question. I hadn't thought about it. Great. Thank you so much. 
Um, I have Senator Sirway, Representative Newman, and who else? Um, Luckner, I believe. So, uh, Senator Sirway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Megan. How are you? Good. Great. Uh, just uh, one question I have is uh, what happens if you have somebody um, falling into this, this uh, crime of uh, invasion of privacy with a drone and they are, we'll just say, a sex offender on a registry, is, would you think that that might raise it up a class if that was happening? Well, it would be a, a new crime. So if, if someone violates a, um, this sex offender registry and does so with a technical violation versus a new criminal conduct, um, that is certainly treated differently. So because it would be new criminal conduct, uh, that would make it more serious. So yes. So, so how does that... How does that work? I mean, as far as bringing it up more serious. So one, one charge can just be violation of the sex offender registry. Okay. And if in addition to that one charge, there's new criminal conduct, which is um, also being looked at at the same time, um, that's, that would simply be more, uh, for the judge to consider. And of course, when we look at sentencing, we're looking at the continuum of how a crime can occur. And if it occurs at the low end of the spectrum, then it's one sentence. And if it occurs more at the higher end, uh, because there's also new criminal conduct, that would be a different sentence. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Newman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got three examples that I'd like to get, get an opinion on. Um, fire departments using drones for search and rescue, trying to find somebody lost, and you happen to be covering multiple properties. Many municipalities now are using drones to look for shoreland zoning violations and things like that. And what happens with companies that do aerial photography and mapping? So, uh Great questions as far as whether or not they would violate the statute. In looking at the violation of privacy statute as we currently have it, it is focused on, and it defines, this is in the statute, private place as a place where one may reasonably expect to be safe from surveillance, including but not limited to changing or dressing rooms bathrooms and similar places. Uh, so that is the expectation of the statute is a place where you'd reasonably expect to be able to have privacy. So uh, my analysis would be, would someone reasonably expect to have privacy in the locations that you've talked about? Um, and so you're saying drone um, mapping is that that was one of your examples um, in looking at like if I look at Google Maps, um, those aren't I'm not seeing a violation of privacy. It's taking a, a big picture overall. Uh, I've certainly seen my house on it doesn't look inside the house. You know, it looks at, at the outside. Um, so it would it would have to really comply with what the statute is calling for, which is a private place where someone has an expectation of privacy. Uh, and so that, that would be the analysis. That would be the question. Um, all right, uh, follow Did that up, answer yeah. the question? Yes, yep. go right ahead. Uh, just have a follow up. Yep. Um, so basically this all started basically for stopping purposes. If you were, had a drone over somebody's house, looking at that, watching them in their backyard. You're still outside. But you're still getting the same video feed if you were, and a town happened to be out there with a, a drone, looking for Julian zoning. You know, somebody's laying out in their yard or whatever. 
Um, how does it differentiate the two? So with stalking, we need three or more instances of the unwanted behavior. And the reason that um, both the Criminal Law Advisory Committee and the Maine Prosecutors Association didn't see the need to add drones to that statute is because we already can prosecute three or more violations. Um, with the example given by Representative Moriarty, uh, it was the second time that the drone had been at their house when they called law enforcement and law enforcement said, there's nothing that we can do about it. So what this would enable us to do is to um, do something about it the first time to say, this is a, it's a violation of privacy and this needs to, this behavior needs to not continue. So, so stalking is just a little different because it requires repeated uh, instances. And generally what we do with stalking is we'll, uh, at least in my district, I ask for a certified letter to be given to tell the person to stop the conduct, to make it clear that the conduct is unwanted. Because one of the elements I have to prove is that it's unwanted. And by giving that certified letter, it, it clearly shows it's unwanted. Um, and then I still have to prove the three or more, three or more instances. Uh, one last follow-up, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Uh, so what's to stop an individual from seeing a drone that a town's using looking for code violations and sending a letter to the town saying they're stopping it? That's if someone's looking for code violations, over, it over. wouldn't be stalking if, if the drone is present once. It's only stalking if it's three or more unwanted violations. So, um, but the question is whether or not it would be an invasion of privacy. And by adding drones to the invasion of privacy statute, um, you, I, I don't know, uh, code violations. I don't know what, uh, what people who enforce co the code violations, what, uh, they're allowed to do. Um, that's, it's not an area that I've, I've looked into. And it's an interesting question is, would they be And I also don't know if they use drones to, um, look into code violations. So it's, some, it's a really good, it's a good question. Yeah, some towns are starting to. Some towns are starting to, okay. Yeah, we've and talked about it. I'm on the select board in Belgrade and we've actually talked about it. Uh, okay, okay. We just passed a, a mooring ordinance that they may okay. use it. We have a local guy that does aerial drone photography and could go out, we could hire him to survey an area looking for the violations. Yeah, so as long as they're not uh, invading someone's privacy in a place where they should, they could reasonably expect privacy, then they would be in compliance with the law. The question is, um, in looking at this statute, is whether or not it's a place where someone has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Yeah, like your, your yard is determining whether your yard is someplace that you consider private. Well, and I mean, that, that really is a policy question that the legislature could consider in terms of if you want to make it clear that it either is or is not a private location. Um, that's, that's a policy question for, for, for all of you um, to make the decision on. All right, thank you. Representative Lipner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, DA Maloney. Uh, excuse me. Um, so my, my question, I get, is it illegal if somebody was standing outside my house with a camera and just like filming me through the window, is that already, is that illegal? So if someone is, I'm going to look at the statute. If someone's filming you outside your house with a camera in order for me to prove that that's a violation of privacy, I would have to prove that they are um, using the camera for the purposes of hearing, recording, amplifying, 
or broadcasting sounds. Mm -hmm. It's all about sounds right now in order for it to be illegal. And so what we're adding is the visual element. Okay, uh, that, that makes sense to me. And I just, I have a couple clarifying questions. Is it, who owns the airspace above someone's property? Or like, you know, I, I, and what's that line? Right, if, if they're not um, recording someone, uh, or, well, who owns the airspace? I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know who owns the airspace. I think the question is really more, are they using that airspace to record something? Because right. if you are, you know, if, if you're throwing a, a, a baseball and it goes over the fence and goes over your neighbor's yard and into someone else's yard, um, passing in the airspace over your neighbor's yard. Right. That's right. That's not illegal in any way. Um, it's only when it, you know, could hit something, cause damage, that it becomes a criminal mischief. P potentially, they would have to have the intention behind it. Um, so the airspace doesn't seem to me to be the issue. The issue seems to be more what are they doing in that airspace? And the real question that, that I would have is what is a private place? Do you want a private place to include someone's um, uh, backyard or not? Uh, because right now the definition in the statute is really focused on dressing rooms, bathrooms and similar places so I would take a restrictive reading of private place from that to say that a private place is really a location with, with walls, some kind of uh, interior location. Um, someone else might read it more broadly. I, I tend to read statutes fairly restrictively unless you, the legislature, tell me to read it more broadly. So I would look at that um, as a private place needing to be along the lines as the example that the statute gives us. And that doesn't appear to include a backyard. That makes so sense. So if you wanted it to, you could add it. Right. Uh, I get the reason I asked that question uh, is just, if, if somebody leaves something in my property, I'm allowed to remove it. And I, I, I'm just thinking, could that be used in this instance where if somebody's flying a drone, it's in my airspace or whoever owns it, you know, it's within, am I allowed to take steps to remove that as sort of like somebody else's property that is on mine? I'm just, I, you know, I don't think it gets at the entire issue, but am I allowed to, you know, take steps to remove that drone? I mean, certainly in the case that Representative Moriarty brought forward, the uh, law enforcement did not think that the individual could remove the drone. I think airspace is really an open question. Um, and they were told that, and this is not a case in my district, so I don't have all of the details behind it. I just have what was in the newspaper. Uh, but they were told, according to the newspaper, that if they tried to damage the drone or remove it, that they could be in violation of the law. Uh, so airspace is, is um, that's a tricky question right now. It's, it's an open question right now uh, because we haven't had drones in the past to deal with. So it, we've never really thought about using airspace in this way. Interesting, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I just, I think we all can Google this and get something and it's interesting. I just did unmanned aircraft defining private airspace, very simple. Uh, and they're saying there are changes to be made. It's still in discussion and it's amazing. So I may read this, it's only 10 pages long. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, all right. Um, Anyone else have any questions for Ms. Maloney? Boy, we put you to task today, huh? That's great. I'm always happy to see everyone. 
Okay. Um, so we're still in favor. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this? I now will ask anyone in opposition to this bill. Anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against? Well, I owe, that's the last one I had there, Mr. Pelletier, so go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the committee, John Pelletier, Chair of the Criminal Law Advisory Commission. We're, we're in favor of the proposed amendment. That's why I signed up as neither for nor against. Um, and uh, I think I can, uh, so in the clock discussion, we got to the conclusion that we thought drones were uh, covered by the existing statute, uh, which is actually very broad with respect to the means by which stalking could be accomplished. But we recognize this problem with invasion of privacy. Looking at the, the current statute, in, in, uh, it looks like it was last amended in 1997. And the paragraph C, as uh, DA Maloney said, deals exclusively with sounds. So at that time, you probably had the advent of uh, a boom microphone that could arguably hear sounds that were inside a building, a nearby building. And the legislature made it illegal to stand in a public place and record sounds in a private place. Well, now it occurs to us that a drone could fly up to a window and record in a private place um, uh, sounds, uh, uh, images that if it, you know, would likely have been particularly a second floor window out of reach. Although the, the, the problem does exist with someone with a camera on the sidewalk, that that would be an issue as well. Uh, but in any event, so we thought uh, that um, in the day and age of drones that adding images to sub C uh, would be an appropriate way to go and that there was an existing gap. And uh, that was the conclusion. And frankly, before I wrote it up, uh, the prosecutors chimed in and, and got the language in, in, in my view, uh, exactly right. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm here to actually support the, uh, support the amendment. Uh, and with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I think on, if I may address some of the questions that have been raised, I think on, on, the, on the issue of the backyard versus something in an upstairs bedroom, you know, that's how I envision it. It seems to me that with that expectation of privacy is an evolving concept. The backyard is, uh, does have protection and warrant analysis and it's called something called the curtilage. But whether someone has a true expectation of privacy in the age of, for their backyard in the age of uh, uh, Google Maps and drones um, is an uncertain question. But there's no question that uh, a vehicle flying outside an upstairs bedroom window and photographing what happens therein uh, is an invasion of privacy and uh, violates an expectation of privacy. And technologically now, that uh, is likely possible. So uh, that's, um, that's, uh, that's how I would address that question. And now I'll, I'll stop and answer any additional questions you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> Great discussion. I didn't think it was going to go this way for, for the title, but it's very good. Um, so anyone else wish to speak in neither for nor against? Oh, excuse me, Representative Warren, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do. Mr. Pelletier, thank you for being here. I want to follow up on a question that Representative Newman had um, he, he brought up a few good points that I, I need to think about as we, you know, discuss this bill. But the one that stuck with me is the idea of code enforcement officers using a drone. And if we pass this legislation, does it work that the legislation is passed and then the code enforcement officers would need to come forward with a bill to get a carve out? Well, it's, I, I, 
I, I really, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but what I would, what I would suggest is, um, it seems to me with modern cameras, you could do the same thing from a low flying fixed wing aircraft. So if you're looking for a code and for code violations in the exterior of a structure or uh, whether a, de a deck exists that wasn't permitted or infringement on a property line, those sorts of things, it seems to me that this statute would not be applicable because you don't have, I wouldn't think that you'd have an expectation of privacy for that. If they're trying to find out whether you've installed a bathroom in your house that is somehow um, not up to code or a violation of a code, it seems to me uh, that looking through, using a drone to look through the window is probably not an appropriate means of doing that and would be subject to a, 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 an invasion of privacy claim. You know, there, there, you have other ways to do that. I imagine administratively, you know, you could ask for a site visit. And I, I, I know there are such things as administrative warrants, which allow people in uh, enforcing regulations to come on to property. Uh, you know, that's the way you would go. I don't think you would um, use a, a drone to look through the windows. Thank you. That's helpful. So just a quick follow up. Now let's say it's law enforcement and they are using a drone. Well, I, on that, on the question of law enforcement, um, I, I would say, well, I don't know that this statute would have applicability, but if it had any applicability, it would enhance the argument that using a drone to look into a home would be an invasion of privacy if the amendment were to pass. Uh, but that would go, you know, that would go under traditional warrant analysis. Right now, uh, the uh, uh, with with some with some exceptions, you need a warrant to go into someone's backyard, uh, what's called the curtilage. Um, and uh, so the question would be: one of the questions might be, is the drone outside the curtilage, or is the drone within the curtilage? But uh, it seems to me that in the the warrant analysis, warrant requirement analysis, or the search and seizure analysis, would be completely separate from what we're talking about, with the exception that were the legislature to pass this statute, then that would be an indication that the legislature understands that people have an expectation of privacy against mechanical devices looking in their windows. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. How do you spell curtilage? Thank you. <laughs> that was my question. I think it's- C-U-R-T-I-L-A-G-E. Oh, wow, I got it. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> I was thinking of all those North Woods main um, programs I've seen with game wardens and drones and poaching and what have you. So, um, but anyways, very interesting topic. So we've got a lot to do and so does Miss Overton. Um, and so we'll look at this next Monday. I don't see anyone else waiting to testify. So I will call this meeting, uh, this hearing of 1021 uh, has ended. Thank you, Mr. Moriarty, or oh, Representative Moriarty. Thank you. Um, we have two bills left. We have um, both um, Representative Warren, uh, you have a choice, 763, 764. Do you wish to do it numerically? Sure, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, so the next is LD763, um, Representative Warren's bill, an act to allow state vehicles <clears throat> assigned to the main emergency management agency employees to be used for commuting. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I'm Charlotte Warren and I'm here today to present to you LD 763 on behalf of the Department of Defense Veterans and Emergency Management Association. This bill allows the department um, excuse me, this bill allows an employee of the Department of Defense, Veterans and Emergency Management, Maine Emergency Management Agency to use a state owned or state leased vehicle to commute between home and work, if so designated by the Commissioner of Defense, Veterans and Emergency Management. And so thank you for the opportunity to present it to you. There'll be somebody here to answer questions. I'm sure he is in the waiting room. So thank you. We have someone, uh, oops, is there someone who wished to uh, either testify, will ask questions or Yes, Mr. Legee, I don't know how to pronounce. I think I have it right. Legee or Legee? They, they both work. They both Joe. work. <laughs> Just try Joe, okay. That works too. Thank that works too. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Warren first for, for sponsoring this bill. Uh, and thank you to the rest of the committee for listening to me here today. My name is Joe Legee. I'm here, I'm the Deputy Director at Maine Emergency Management Agency. And I'm here to provide testimony in support of LD 763. This bill proposes to amend the existing law to allow an employee uh, of Maine Emergency Management Agency uh, to use a state owned or state leased vehicle to commute between home and work. Current law prohibits uh, the use of state vehicles to commute between home and work, uh, except in the case of employees of the Baxter State Park Authority, Maine uh, Military Bureau, and several law enforcement agencies to include, but not limited to the Maine State Police. This bill will authorize MEMA to do the same. Under Title 37B, the director of MEMA is responsible for representing the governor in all matters pertaining to the disaster and emergency response of the state to coordinate the activities of all organizations uh, for emergency management within the state and to maintain liaison with and cooperate with emergency management and public safety agencies and organizations of other states, the federal government and foreign countries and their political subdivisions. Given the likely environment present in areas affected by disaster, it's critical that the director or their designee have an appropriately marked vehicle to perform these missions safely. Considering both the fast pace of disaster response operations and the likely hazards present, it is generally not feasible for the director to drive to Augusta to procure a state fleet vehicle before heading to the disaster affected area. Nor does the agency have vehicles that are marked appropriately with amber lights. These lights along with other markings on the vehicle and the state radio to be installed are not a luxury. They are standard equipment expected to ensure the safety of state response staff. The vehicle will carry a cost, which will be borne by the agency out of our existing budget using a combination of state and federal grant funds. With these things in mind, we encourage you to pass LD 763. This concludes my testimony and I'm standing by to answer questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. McGee. Uh, McGee. Uh, just one question that uh, you said the bill proposes to amend existing law. So are you familiar with why, what, why the law was to not allow vehicles? Are you familiar with any of the history of that law in the first place? I, I am not. I am not, sir, uh, familiar with the, the origin of the law. Um, I have looked at the exception of the law, and it seems to be for uh, response-based personnel from a number of different state agencies. 
uh, but I'm not uh, familiar with the origination of the law and kind of the, the distinction between, it, it seems as though it's for response versus not response-based personnel. Okay, follow-up, please. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah, and, and the follow-up would be, is the bill intending that to allow employees or just this one employee, the director? Because uh, I'm really not sure whether it's, uh, it almost sounds as though it's talking about employees rather than employees. So can, can you just clarify that, please? The, the intention of the change, sir, is for the vehicle, the vehicle to be used by the director of Maine Emergency Management Agency. So we're talking about one, one vehicle, one employee. Correct, sir. Okay, thank you. Spam risk, that's the phone calls I'm getting right now. Um, oh, um, are you all done, uh, Representative Pickett? Okay, Senator Seaway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I just uh, had a question. Um, is, is this... Um, would this be paid for by the federal uh, monies if if, uh, if there's an emergency system put in place? Um, and also, is this a policy thing? I mean, I don't want to get in the middle of a union issue um, because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, there's like domestic violence, there's many other organizations that are very similar that could end up doing the same thing as what you're asking. And it's not like a, a first response, you're almost like the second response. And in law enforcement, the cruises are their office. And it's a little different. You, you, you know, so I'm asking that, what you, your thoughts are on that. Sure. So a couple, um, from a policy standpoint, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if it's a, a policy situation um, we really evaluated the, the usage cases uh, for the vehicle, which are different, uh, as you said, from kind of a first responder usage case uh, in, in the you know, case of like law enforcement. Uh, really, the role of the director is to, is to show up not at first response, but to, at the scene, maybe an incident command post disaster affected area to really liaise between uh, other state officials, uh, FEMA officials, if they're on site for damage assessments and other purposes. Uh, and, and any other officials local or county that are on that scene. Uh, so the, the usage case is different than, than local law enforcement. Uh, in terms of the funding piece, um, we would use steady state funds, uh, state and federal to pay for the vehicle uh, out of our current budget. Um, I could look up though, is a very good question. Uh, given the case of a specific disaster, would there be disaster funding available uh, should the vehicle be used in a, in a, you know, for that disaster in particular? Uh, and we'd have to look at the public assistance uh, guidance for that program to see if that is applicable, uh, but it could very well be. And that's something we could look up for the work session. Thank you. Um, Mr. Legge, are you familiar? Oh, I'm gonna recognize the hand up I just saw. Um, Representative Renecki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, how often um, would the director actually be called out in a normal year? That's a good question. I, you know, it really depends on kind of the, on the year in question. Uh, a year like 2020 uh, was, was a very busy year with everything from uh, shark attacks uh, to landslides and, and other disasters. Um, so it'd, be, it'd really be dependent upon kind of the, the kind of uh, year that we're having and how busy uh, the situation is. Um, but so it could vary any, any time between, you know, a, a few different uh, disasters, you know, depending locally on what's going on. There might be flooding events. Uh, there might be issues with ice jams, things of that nature that require uh, some coordination with federal agencies. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Um, Unfortunately, you didn't really answer my question. 
Um, what's been, say, the last five years average, um, the number of times the director has actually been called out? That's a good, I'd, so to get you a specific number, I'd have to chat with the director and kind of get a, get a sense of how many times he's used. Currently, he's using his personal vehicle to, to go out in situations like that. Uh, so I can get some numbers for you for the work session. That would be appreciated. One more follow-up, Madam Chair. Yes, go right ahead. Um, does he currently get mileage from the state for using his personal vehicle? Um, he would be, uh, I'm trying to think of the state regs. Um, I know there's a distinction between, you know, he gets mileage over and above kind of his normal steady state drive, which would be in his particular case um, from Yarmouth to Augusta. So anything outside of that, he would likely be eligible for uh, per diem reimbursement. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Leggy, uh, <clears throat> do they still have uh, a fleet of vehicles? Do they still call it the fleet um, where people do, if they needed a car once a month, they could be assigned one? They do. They, um, yes, there is still a central fleet uh, with which you can, you can uh, procure vehicles. Now, and all these- the, the only issue- Go right ahead, sorry, I interrupted. I, I was just gonna say that um, the one issue that we do have is those vehicles are located in Augusta. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a timeliness factor uh, there that would require the director to return to Augusta to procure a vehicle um, and then head to the, the scene. Now, I, I, I want to ask the question, you mentioned costs, um, and I, as I'm asking this question, I'm going to be asking Ms. Oberton, I would like to see uh, some information more about the fleet vehicles, um, if they the, if they're assigned to these people, these, uh, these agencies, uh, if they're responsible for maintenance, uh, repairs, or if it has to go back to the fleet uh, to be done. Um, whatever information we can get. Um, I just lost my train of thought about... Uh, I understand, oh, go through this often. If you are in charge and have to be at the ready, especially when you say you report directly to the governor in a state of emergency, uh, and you live in Machias and you've got to rush down to Augusta to pick up a car to go back to Callis for an emergency, that's the problem. Um, so um, I'm gonna see the information that Ms. Overton can provide us about that whole fleet vehicle. And I get that one question about costs. What are the costs that you would incur? <clears throat> I'd have to grab the fiscal note uh, attached to the bill. We had looked at the cost of, uh, we did do a cost comparison of uh, leasing a vehicle versus purchasing one outright. And I believe we settled on, it would be more cost effective to lease a vehicle. Um, and we would be working with fleet, uh, central fleet to procure that vehicle. Okay, good. I'm sorry, I didn't look up fiscal note. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, anyone else? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Anyone wish to testify in favor of this um, bill, LD 763? Seeing none, anyone oppose? Anyone wishing to testify neither for nor against? Seeing no other questions or testimony, I will call this um, meeting um, or this hearing of 7.63 to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Legge. He, he quickly left. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, LD 7.64. 7.64 is an act to authorize the main Whoops, it's the same, okay. <laughs> An act to authorize the Maine Emergency Management Agency to 
I'm not going to say it, requisition, requisition. Food supplies for emergency use or special duty assignments. And again, um, it's the same playbill here, Warren and Legee. So <laughs> Representative Warren, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to members of the Criminal Justice Committee for the opportunity to present this bill to you, LD 764. This bill authorizes the Department of Defense, Veterans and Emergency Management, Maine Emergency Management Agency to requisition food supplies for emergency use or special duty assignments and corrects a reference to the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, Bureau of Forestry. And Mr. Legee is here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. You wish to provide test, my God, you wish to provide a testimony, Mr. Legee? Yes, I do. Okay, thank, uh, th you. Th thank you again, Representative Warren. Uh, for sponsoring this bill. And thank you again for uh, distinguished mem members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety for, for hearing uh, another bill. Again, my name is Joe Legee. I am the Deputy Director at Maine Emergency Management Agency. And I'm here today to provide testimony in support of LD 764, an act to authorize the Maine Emergency Management Agency to requisition food supplies for emergency use or special duty assignments. Uh, this, this bill proposes to amend uh, Title V, Section 8C, to include the Maine Emergency Management Agency as an entity that can purchase food and food supplies for agency personnel under emergency conditions. Current law prohibits the purchasing of food and food supplies for any person by requisition or otherwise, except that the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Bureau of Forestry may requisition food supplies for emergency use. This bill will authorize MEMA to do the same. We have now passed the one year anniversary of the COVID-19 state of emergency, federal disaster declaration and full activation of the state's emergency operations center. At the beginning of the pandemic, our EOC required activation seven days a week for a minimum of 12 hours per day. Under Title 37B, the director of Maine Emergency Management Agency is responsible to maintain and operate a primary emergency operations center on behalf of the governor. In order to safely and, uh, safely and effectively execute this mission, it's critical that the agency is able to procure the necessary supplies to sustain staff at the uh, state EOC. Considering both the fast pace of disaster response operations and the safety of the environment outside of the EOC, it is generally not feasible to send EOC staff off premises individually to procure food. Given COVID-19 as an example, food establishments have been periodically closed and when open, presented a risk of exposure for a critical state response staff. Even in more standard disasters, roads may be flooded, blocked due to down lines or, or otherwise closed, making it unsafe to send staff out individually to procure food. The food will carry a cost, which will be borne by the agency out of our existing budget. However, the food in question is an eligible expense under federally declared disasters uh, and all attempts will be made to seek federal reimbursement in these situations. With these things in mind, we encourage you to pass LD 764. This concludes my testimony and I'm standing by for any questions you have. Yes. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Legee? Uh, Representative Renicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. What constitutes a special duty assignment outside of an emergency? It says emergency use or special duty assignment. So what's a special duty assignment? A uh, special duty assignment would be assignment to the state's emergency operations center under a state of emergency proclamation. So going to work for the day under this COVID stuff, you would consider a special duty assignment? Going to work uh, specifically within the State Emergency Operations Center, correct? Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any hands up. 
Okay. Um, I, I, I'm, my train of thought is both bills, uh, the fiscal note from what I see has not yet been determined. Uh, will we see that at our work session or is that? Uh, I believe. Yeah, I believe you're ask, asking me, ma'am. Uh, repeat, please. I, are you asking me, ma'am, for the about uh, that? No, I, I was. You could, but I thought for the work session, I was going to ask um, our policy analyst if we would have that. Do you have a response to that, Mr. Legate? Do you have a response oh, sorry. to that? Uh, I believe we have a fiscal note for the uh, for 763 um, okay. for 764. Uh, the cost really depends on the length of that special duty assignment, um, whether that's, you know, uh, really the, the EOC might be open for in a, COVID's really an exception case. Uh, Can you generally share the EOC with us? Could, yeah. Could you share with us the fiscal note on 763? We sure can. Is that something you're looking for right now? Senator? If, you have, if not, we can wait for the work session. We're fine. All right? Yeah, we're fine. I'll bring it to, we'll I can bring it to the work session. Good. Thank you. Um, seeing no more questions, thank you. Anyone else uh, wishing to speak in favor of this bill? Seeing none. Anyone in uh, opposition? Opposed to the bill? None. And neither for nor against. Therefore, I will rule that LD 764, the hearing is now closed. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Lujan. Thank you all. Yep. Very good. It is now uh, 1208. We are next. Um, Meeting is at one. We have three bills. Um, is one all right with everybody? Yeah, at one. Uh, Mr. Representative Pickett, okay? Yeah, we'll see you at all one. All right. See you at one. Thank you. Bye bye.
So, Deb, I'm in the office today. I'm over at the stay house here. <laughs> I said I could tell. There is a difference <laughs> in the background. I hate this spell check. I wrote down Bill, B-I-L-L. -L. I sent it, it's written B-U-I-L-D. Oh dear. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, well, Damn. Isn't technology Damn. grand. Like I'm gonna make a mistake with B-I-L-L, -L. jeez. Senator DeChambeau, yes. just to let you know, Senator Miramont is here in the waiting room. Okay. I don't know what order we're going in, but. Um, uh, well. Um, let's see now. He's 801. Well, we have Senator Searway. Do you mind if we grab Senator Miramont, if you're going to remain here? Well, I, I don't have a problem, but I think, um, uh, District Attorney Megan Maloney's with the person oh. that's going to testify, so might want to... Mine won't last too long, I don't think. Well, <clears throat> I think we'll defer to, um, is she here, Megan? She might, well, we'll see who shows up and when we start here. Okay, yeah. We're not on, are we, Deb? Yes, we are. It, it, oh. Once we start, we're on YouTube the whole time. Okay. Jeez, just my eyes. <laughs> Jeepers, by Friday, we're going to go crazy with all these bills in our head. I'm taking lots of notes. 24 this week. Yeah. So are we going to try to skip the days that I have something else on Fridays or work around that? I think we've got to work around it because we've, we're we supposed to have things reported out by May 7th. Charlotte is worried about making a deadline? Gosh. Yeah. Lawmaker, lawbreaker. I know. Well, let's, let's figure out the schedule. I think Friday I might be gone too. I don't know. Not look, looking good. Senator DeChambeau. I owe you nothing, Representative Pickett. That is correct. You don't, but I, uh, you, if you don't already know, uh, one of my members, Dan had, uh, Dan Costain, uh, had to leave. Okay. Yeah, he was not feeling well. It wasn't uh, anything bad, but I just told him, I said, if you're feeling feeling like that, you, you ought to just uh, head for the barn and, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll bring you up to speed on where we are. Good. Charlotte, can you see this? Look at that. That's where I was last week. 
I know. That that's just the good part. <laughs> oh gosh. I see I'm you glad. moved your camera. See you moved your camera, Senator, so I can't see your flowers that are wilting. Oh, they are. I know. I I was gonna remove them this morning. Did uh, Charlotte tell you I was gonna buy her camp? The one she's gotten back over this morning? <laughs> We could be neighbors, Richard. There you go. Is there any <laughs> land nearby one way or another? <laughs> it is all paper company. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. I mean, we can be at camp sometimes for like four days. And one of my friends will be like, Char, Char. I'll come out. I'll be like, what's going on? They'll be like, a boat. <laughs> Look, it's a boat. There's people. It's <laughs> We're so far up. We're very, very lucky. Oh, yeah. I, I, I tell you, the farther you can get away from civilization and just enjoy God's green earth, the better off you are. Yeah. That's what I do. Whenever I have a chance, shut the cell phone off and go to camp. Yep. I don't blame you a bit. All right. Shelly should be right with us. She... Uh, she said she should be right along, but if you know if we have to start without her, we I guess we probably can. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, Representative Pluker's here. One, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> Representative Pluka, yeah, you are. Okay, we shall begin. Um, um, Attorney Maloney's not in yet, so I'll begin with. Um, um, Attorney Maloney is in the waiting room. Oh, she is? All right. Um, okay, we'll start with uh, the next one, and then we'll go to um, Senator um, Mayamont. So, um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. It's 1.06 p.m. Monday, April 5th, uh, part two. Um, I am Senator Susan DeChambeau, Senate Chair, and I will tell you right now that I represent um, Dayton, Lyman, Alfred, Arundel, Kenny Port in my hometown of Biddeford. I will ask um, my House co-chair, uh, Representative Warren, to introduce herself. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Charlotte Warren, and I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of West Gardner. I will, and I, will I will um, recognize Senator Searway. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Scott Searway, and I represent District 16, which uh, covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, Clinton, and Unity Township. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pluker. Hi, I represent House District 95, which is Hope Warren, Appleton, oh. and Party Union. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Representative Pickett. I don't know how I got Pluker out of Pickett, but go ahead, <laughs> Representative Well, Pickett. they both start with P. I, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dick Pickett. I represent House District 116, the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. And Representative Renicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Shelley Rodnicki. I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield. And once again, I'm here under protest because we adjourned signed die on Tuesday, which misrepresented misrepresented to the people of Maine that we were done our work. Thank you. <clears throat> and Representative Newman. Yes, I'm uh, Dan Newman, District 76, which is Belgrade, Rome, Mount Vernon, Fayette, Diana, and Wayne. Thank you. Representative Luckner. Good afternoon. My name is Grayson Luckner. I represent part of Portland in District 37, the neighborhoods of Rosemont, Strawwater, Libby Town, and Nason's Corner. Thank you. 
Um, this afternoon, we have three bills. I will call them in order of LD 1070, followed by LD 801, and we'll end with LD 96, uh, 696. Um, so the first one today is um, present, excuse me, sponsored by Senator Searway. The title of the bill is an act to make assault on a person 50 years of age or, or older with a pre-existing serious medical condition, a class C crime. Uh, Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am State Senator Scott Searway, and I represent Senate District 16, which includes Albion, Benton, Clinton, Fairfield, Unity Township, Waterville, and Winslow. I am before you today to present LD 1070, an act to make assault on a person 50 years of age or older with a pre-existing serious medical condition, a class C crime. Assault is a serious matter, one that must be treated as such. If someone knowing and reckless, recklessly assaults someone, especially when the victim has a pre-existing medical condition that is even more serious and a penalty must be faced, this bill before you takes that into consideration by making it a class C crime. If, if someone were to assault an individual 50 years of age or older with a serious pre-existing medical condition. Um, and one other thing I am um, uh, willing for an amendment. Uh, I know that uh, I think um, DA Meg Maloney may have an amendment to it, and I'd be uh, willing to go along with that. So I'll, I'll let her speak on that. But thank you for your time and consideration of this legislation, and I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Are there any questions for Senator Seaway? Oh, and I was... Um... I overlooked two very important people here. Um, Jane Orbiton is with us. She is our policy analyst. And uh, you will see Deb Fay, I, our uh, committee clerk. Um, Representative Reckett, would you introduce yourself, please? You are muted, Lois. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lois Reckett and I represent District 31, which is uh, part of South Portland. Thank you. Oceanside. Um, Oceanside the ocean end of South Portland. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll begin by formally asking if there's anyone who wishes to speak in support of this bill. Um, um, Ms. Maloney, do you wish to speak? with, um, as suggested by Senator Searway. Hi. Hello, sorry, I did you call on me? It was- Well, lonely. I am asking if you're speaking in favor and you, you have possibly an amendment, okay? So I will turn that over to you. Thank you, I am speaking in favor. Okay. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Megan Maloney. I am the District Attorney for Kennebec and Somerset Counties and the President of the Maine Prosecutors Association. I am submitting this testimony on behalf of the MPA's unanimous support of LD 1070. When one person beats and kicks another person with use of hands and feet, the crime is called assault. Assault is a misdemeanor. The typical punishment for assault is a $300 fine and no jail time, although jail time can be ordered. Probation, however, is not allowed by the assault statute. If a person committing the assault uses a weapon or attacks a person under the age of six, the crime can be elevated to a class C felony. 
But if a young, healthy person attacks an elderly, frail person, the law classifies this conduct still as a misdemeanor assault. The level of crime should change when the victim is vulnerable. So this is what happened in Waterville. And I know that um, Sandy and Herbert Bradley are also wanting to speak in favor of the bill as this occurred to them, where a strong young adult man attacked uh, this, the Bradleys, a couple in their 70s. And it was only days after Mr. Bradley came home from the hospital after heart surgery. This was unfortunately only able to be charged as a misdemeanor, even though everyone in my office, and we even consulted with the attorney general's office, tried to find a felony due to the um, uneven nature of the attack of a young, healthy adult man on two people who uh, were more frail and unable to defend themselves due to age. So I would offer a friendly amendment to change the age of the victim to 65 and to remove the pre-existing medical condition requirement. The reason is it will be nearly impossible to prove that an attacker knew about the pre-existing medical condition, whereas age is easier to prove. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well stated, thank you, Ms. Maloney. Um, any questions of Attorney Maloney? Or I should say District Attorney Maloney. Um, yes, um, I have. Representative Warren followed by Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, DA Maloney. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm struggling to understand. Um, so you prosecuted this case. Yes. And tell me why couldn't you prosecute it as an aggravated assault? You could only get a, a misdemeanor charge? That's right. So it's it's a misdemeanor under the law because in order to get up to a felony level, you need either a wit, uh, either a weapon or you need um, a victim under the age of six or um, extended convalescence, which the law court has defined for us as a an extended period of time in order to recover from the injuries or lasting injuries. And we didn't have that in this case. Okay, thank you. Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, um, Attorney Maloney. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, to ask the. Uh, you said if I correct, if I'm correct, you uh, correct in, in uh, restating it. You said you wanted to amend the age to 65 and remove the pre-existing serious medical condition. Condition is that correct? Uh, that is correct, and that's because of provability. What is able to actually be proven beyond a reasonable doubt? We have been successful in proving age, but proving that someone had a serious medical condition, I think um, that could make this change uh, one that we just never use because it would be so unlikely that we'd ever be able to prove that the attacker knew of that element. And, and, and I, understand, I understand what you're saying, but the other part of that is if you had it like it is right now, even if the, even in just like a regular assault right now, and an elderly person was was a was attacked and was and was uh, beaten up badly, and they had pre-existing serious conditions that you found out at the time of that attack, even though the person maybe didn't know they they had it, the attacker maybe didn't know that, that still puts us back to the fact that. You could be, you're looking at a misdemeanor assault and not, and unless there's some kind of convalescence or something like that, that they have to go and, and stuff is. And I'm very aware of that. So I keep having this vision that just was burnt into my, into my head uh, 
this summer of an attack that took place on a on a young on an older man. He was he had a he had a carriage, a little small carriage, not a carriage, but he was, had his little granddaughter with him, and he was pushing that, and he was attacked by three people, all youngsters, and they. And one of them in particular was kicking him when he was down, kicking him in the head, kicking him here and there. And I just think that something needs to be done for the elderly that are out here and that these people attack and a, and a misdemeanor does not fit the crime. I think the, I think the punishment should fit the crime. And so I, I understand the fact of, of the being able to know in a person's head, but I just wish there was some way we could possibly fix the statute so that we can make it so when one of these kind of kind of attacks take place and the district attorney that is covering that knows what they are, that there's something in law that they can put it into that they can hold the person accountable for what they actually did. Um, so I, that's that's my that's my kind of it's kind of my my heartburn with this with this case with this particular bill. And Representative Pickett, I agree with you. That's the law should protect vulnerable victims at a different higher level than other victims. It's different when two people who are both 30 punch each other in a bar fight than if someone who is a young, healthy, strong adult attacks someone who has now reached advanced age. Uh, those are different situations and the law doesn't currently reflect that difference. So the example that you gave is a perfect example where if the statute was changed to uh, treating victims that are age 65 and older with a uh, being able to charge that as a felony, that would address the situation that you bring up perfectly. I, I agree. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a, a couple of questions, but just thinking about the answer you just gave, if we have two people who are 65 or older attacking each other, is that a something we should worry about potentially being subject to this, to this uh, bill? Um, well, if it's, if the, if the victim is, let me look at the language exactly. Um, if the victim is 65 or older, then yes, it would be able to be charged as a felony. And that's where really prosecutorial discretion would come in because we would see that it's, it's, it's not exactly what uh, was intended at the time that this legislation was passed. But you're right, it would meet the definition. Would a possible amendment be that the, there needs to be some discrepancy in their ages? That that would take care of the problem. Absolutely. Yep. You could say at least a 10 year difference in age, something like that. Thank you. And, I, and I'm new to the committee. So I'm new. I just got my book over the weekend. I'm learning my way around. Um, I'm looking at under aggravated assault and, I, and it's, uh, and it's, it's one C under there. So looking at, um, so you would have the manner, the number, location, nature of the injuries, the manner of method inflicted, and the observable physical condition of the victim. So you wouldn't, if someone were kicking somebody who was down, you wouldn't be able to get a felony charge or a class B crime off of that. Could you help me understand what is it, what, how is that interpreted in the courts? It, it depends on how the victim's recovery goes. So it depends on uh, the extent of the injuries and whether or not there is extended convalescence as defined by the law court. So the, our, our Supreme Court in Maine has given us a lot of guidance on what meets the definition of aggravated assault. And they have um, clarified that extended convalescence is necessary in order to charge something as an aggravated assault. And in many of these cases, the victim recovers within a week or two uh, physically, but there are lasting emotional and psychological uh, damage to being attacked 
um, especially in your either your older years or the very young years. So we currently protect the very young, those under age six, and this would have us protecting the very old. Makes sense. And it, so the court, just one more follow-up, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, go right ahead. Thank you. So the court doesn't necessarily look at the manner or method of the inflicted harm. It's more about convalescence. Well, as far as whether it's an aggravated assault or a regular assault, where there, there are times when, um, like if you use a weapon, that can cause it to be elevated. Um, if you, there, the manner can be, if it's strangulation, um, that is an aggravated assault and that is articulated under the statute. Um, if it shows uh, there's a extreme indifference to the value of human life, um, th so there are certain catchphrases that have been further defined by the court that we also can look at in order to elevate it. And, and don't forget, we're elevating not even so much as to be able to ask for jail time, but to be able to ask for probation. Because mm -hmm. with assault, you, we can't have probation. It's, Thank it's you very not much. allowed. Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, DA Maloney. Just, I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around this. Um, so if we take out the parts that you suggested, now we're adding in guilty of assault if the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causes bodily injury to another person who is 65 years of age or older. Correct. And you're saying that you want that to be a felony, but you don't want it to be a felony so that you can put people in jail. You want it to be a felony so that you can give them probation. Well, to, to be fair, that is going to be up to the, to the case. What I currently, a misdemeanor assault can carry jail time. So you can ask for jail with a misdemeanor assault. You cannot ask for probation. It's, it's, not, it's not an option if so someone is charged. So, what's so powerful for you about the probation here? That enables us to ask for things like um, counseling monitored by the probation officer, can be mental health, substance abuse, any other um, interventions that could prevent the attacker from acting in this way again in the future. Couldn't you do that with a deferred disposition? You can do it with a deferred, but then there's no one who can monitor. So depending on the, with, with a deferred, at the end of the year, uh, the, the defense attorney gives the prosecutor information to show, yes, what was supposed to happen happened or no, it did not. There's no one that is checking in with the defendant on a regular basis. So Isn't there's or even on... any basis. I'm sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, sorry, that, that's all. Senator, may I ask just one more follow-up? Yeah, I don't want to forget my question, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll be quick. It really is a clarifying question because I've always assumed that that is the power of a deferred disposition on these misdemeanors is that the person is, I thought, paying a fee to the district attorney's office, et cetera, and they are being monitored and it is actually corrective, right? As opposed to just sort of putting somebody away, it's actually corrective in that they're going to do all of these things and then you're going to say, yep, you don't have this charge. So right. did you mean to say that that doesn't happen in a deferred? So it, it does, deferreds are definitely used for corrective behavior. You're a hundred percent correct. The, the difference is that you don't meet with your deferred officer, like a person would meet with their probation officer. So there's a, there's a regularly scheduled meeting with your probation officer where the probation officer um, will say, 
okay, have you signed up for counseling yet? Have you done this, this, go through the court order with the individual and make sure that all of those items are being followed. With a deferred, they are, it's a wonderful tool if you have um, one of two things happening. If you, like, I'll use a deferred in conjunction with a treatment court because then the case managers on the treatment court are going to assist the person in complying with all of the different pieces of the court order. Also a deferred can be great for a low level misdemeanor where the individual needs to do something um, like get their license back in order to have an operation op operating after suspension charge dismissed. So something relatively minor that they don't need a lot of help with. Um, or it could be, I, I, we've got a great crisis and counseling program where they're gonna work with the individual. But I don't have someone in my office for an individual to meet with on a weekly basis to kind of walk them through what is being ordered under a deferred. And so probation is just, um, it's just a far better tool if the person needs uh, more assistance and needs more uh, needs someone to kind of walk with them step by step what's what's going on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, hey, calling you Miss Maloney when I'm so used to calling you Megan is okay. Megan's fine. <laughs> no. no um, so if we remove and, and your amendment requests that we remove pre-existing serious condition. The rest of that underline is the purpose of this paragraph. It defines, and if we remove it, it means a condition materially impairs or is likely to be uh, materially impaired, the health of a person. Um, maybe I'm going off on this. You also use the term convalescent uh, I know I use that. I just looked it up. It means someone who is recovering. It doesn't mean um, someone who may have uh, early onset dementia or someone who is beginning with Parkinson's and has a problem with the gait um, or, or ALS or what have you. Um, I'm always bothered by age. Age does not define someone's uh, physical health um, or, or um, mental health or what have you. Um, so that's what I'm concerned about. Um, 65, so if you're 60, uh, it's still a misdemeanor. If you're 64, it's a misdemeanor. 65 magic number. And it doesn't matter if you are healthy and run five miles a day at age 65, the 60 year old can't even get out of bed without some help. So those are the questions and the, the line of demarcation is felony or misdemeanor. So um, those are the real difficult things that, you know, every year we have one of these, not this particular, but ages. Um, so I understand your rationalization for all that. Um, I would qualify for this. Someone, <laughs> someone hit me. Um, so, okay, I just, I didn't have a question there. I'm sorry. I just wanted to throw that out to see if I was correct or if you were gonna point me to something else. So, um, I mean, I certainly think you're correct. You're, we're making a decision on where that line is. Like with children, we say those under six. So if a child is five, then it's a felony. And if the child is six, then it's a misdemeanor. So we, we do those lines. They don't always work, but we, we struggle with trying to find the best line we can. Okay, um, I'm gonna recognize Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my apologies, I've been on um, audio. Uh, I had to drive my daughter somewhere. Um, I, I'm wondering a couple things, um, DA Maloney. The first is around, you know, what's our, what's our goal 
um, where, you know, we, we hear often that, you know, there's a couple different goals of the criminal justice system. One is punishment, one is deterrence. Um, and some folks have more of a rehabilitative goal. And I heard you talking about that uh, with the probation aspect of it. Um, you know, and, and, and then I would say public safety. And so what gets us to true public safety is kind of the frame I like to see it in. And so I'm wondering, you know, a question about, in my mind through this bill is, are we getting to public safety by increasing uh, this to a felony for this age group? And then the second thing is, you know, thinking about factors on sentencing um, and that, um, you know, there's an opportunity there, I think, and maybe you could speak a little bit to it more, you know, sentencing processes better than any of us. Um, how some of these factors that maybe don't add up or you can't prove aggravated um, assault, how they can come into play uh, when the judge makes the sentencing, the sentencing uh, decision. Sure, so starting with the beginning of your question, I believe that elevating an assault on an elderly person to a felony meets all of the goals that you set, because it really is about saying to the public, we're going to treat it differently when you attack a vulnerable person. And there are vulnerable people at both ends of the spectrum, of the age spectrum. And we've, we're, we're doing a good job at protecting one end of the age spectrum, and now let's protect the other end. Um, and there's no magic as to the number 65. It just, um, that's the number that we use for retirement. So that's why it seemed like a good number to me. But it does, it, it is for all of the purposes that you said, public safety, um, for more rehabilitation with more teeth, because we're able to not only ask for jail, but we could also ask for probation. Um, and it also is for, um, uh, uh, in it's for punishment to say, yeah, this is a felony. It's, it's a much bigger deal if you attack someone who's vulnerable versus if you are in a bar fight, right? There's, those are very different things. And so the law should reflect that difference. Now, currently, getting to the second part of your question, you are absolutely right that the law can reflect that difference when it comes to sentencing on a misdemeanor. So while the typical sentence is a $300 fine, for a misdemeanor assault, it can be, uh, it can include jail time. It can include uh, up to a, a year in county jail, although I've never seen that. Um, in, in reality, it would be, uh, I think the, the highest sentence I've ever seen requested is nine months, but that's still a substantial period of time. So you certainly can request uh, based on a large spectrum, um, depending on how serious the assault was. So the law does currently allow that to occur. The only piece that can't currently be requested for misdemeanor assault is probation. Okay, that's helpful. Um, can I follow up with one more question, uh, Senator? Yeah. So if, you know, and when I laid out the framework of some people think the goals of criminal justice system is punishment. I'm kind of trying to move away from that. Um, but, uh, but I was wondering, so if we're trying with this bill to get at probation, um, couldn't we just include class D assault as one of the misdemeanors that can be approved for probation? And maybe instead of trying to legislate based on one case or you know one case a year that um, we can expand a toolbox there and maybe help rehabilitate more folks? You certainly could. I mean, looking at probation, we'd be looking at section 1802, where it, it's 17A section 1802, where it says eligibility for sentencing alternative that includes period of probation. And under section B, um, the conviction is for a class D or E crime other than and so you could list in that section uh, assault if you wanted to open up all assaults for probation. Um, I think the reason not to go that direction might be because not all assaults really do call for probation. And so uh, 
wanting to make sure that we're limiting probation to those that are um, for, for people who really need that level of supervision. Um, but that, that would be another way of going about it is by addressing that statute. Thank you. Seeing no other hands up, I'd like to uh, call on, um, whoops. Um, anyone else that wish to speak in support of this bill? Um, Mr. and Mrs. Bradley, I believe? Yes. yes. Do you wish to give testimony or speak uh, in support of this bill? Yes, I do. My Go name ahead. is Andrew Bradley. Yeah. And on June 8th, I was innocently attacked by a 20-year-old on, nine, well, actually 19 at the time, on drugs. I never saw him coming. He came up behind me, punched me to the side of the head, threw me to the ground, and I ended up being taken by ambulance to the local hospital. I have some very graphic pictures of my injuries, and it's hard for me to think that this happened in June 8, 2020. He has not been made accountable for his actions upon us. Um, because we did not land in the hospital with broken bones, it's considered a simple assault. And the, the, the mental trauma of living here in our neighborhood, he lives two houses away, nothing has ever happened to him to this day. And that's a very hard pill to swallow because mentally I have gone to counseling. I have done everything I can to overcome this. I am the mother of two sons. I am the grandmother of four grandchildren. I do not bring my grandchildren to my neighborhood. And this, is, this has been a very, very difficult thing. And I think that something has to be done about this behavior. The, it, I am a product of going to therapy and I still am struggling with a lot of issues of sleep deprivation, of fear, of anxiety, this was, a, this was a terrible trauma to me. And to also watch my husband, who had just had heart surgery, being beaten by this young man, thrown to the ground, bruises to his chest, a fat lip, head lacerations, hematoma to his head, hematoma to my head. And I think something needs to be done. The, not, the law has to be addressed. And I don't believe that we're the first victims of this kind of crime. So I, I appreciate all of you listening, trying to resolve something to happen, to, to, for somebody to made, be made accountable for the actions and the choices that they made that day to alter our lives. Thank you very much for that very poignant uh explanation and I think uh, we all share um, that that was a tragic, scary time. Um, it was a very scary time. You mind if I show you a you. few pictures? We really can't. Okay. Uh, do, well, um, I would defer. Yes, they wish to have. No, we, excuse me. We have a rule that has to That's apply to I everyone. Thought of no props, sir. Yeah. So no we let one person will be. That's fine, I understand that. Yep. Um, I agree with you very much, Mr. Pickett. And I just want to say that I want you to think about if this was one of you's parents or grandparents, or grandparents going through this, no person should have to go through this in their own neighborhood where they have lived for 28 years and to be subjected to a physical assault by a young man who chose to do, who bought drugs. And I, 
I, I think there are, he needs to be made accountable for his actions. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Breckett. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm very sorry for your uh, circumstance, uh, Mrs. Bradley. Thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you whether or not you had had some compensation for your <clears throat> costs of therapy and things like that. <clears throat> Are you aware of the Victim Compensation Fund? Is that where you've managed to do that? We have had nothing. We have been, so this is all on our own, our own expenses. We have had, we had a horrendous medical bill, which fortunately we had insurance, but it did not pay for the whole thing. The hospital after so many months said, you need to pay this, it goes to collection. So before our name was affected by collection, we had to pay these pills. And um, we pay the co-payment of my uh, counseling. There is, a, there is a lot entailed in this. I wish I could tell you that today, 10, min, 10 months later, that I'm doing a lot better. But this horrendous fear and anxiety, knowing that this happened from a perpetrator two houses away. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. What I'm uh, suggesting <clears throat> is that you investigate uh, or apply to the Victim Compensation Fund, which is housed in the district attorney's office, where there should be, I believe, uh, if I'm, unless I've totally lost track of what's happening with that, is basically available to victims like yourself who have had costs associated with a crime committed against them. So you might be able to get reimbursement for some of what you've had to pay out. So I don't know what the caps are or anything else, but there is a there is a whole victim compensation fund and it's based out of the district attorney's office. So if you make a call to, the, uh, to uh, Aaron Fry's office, the district attorney in Maine, you should be able to find out about that. So that's all I'm suggesting is it might be of some financial help to you. We have changed, we have had to change the protection of our house. We, a lot of things have changed, have changed since June 8th. We will check on that. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. And thank you for that information. Uh, yeah, the district attorney's office should be able to help you and direct you. Uh, um, did anybody hear the district attorney say, is this case still being reviewed, still ongoing? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. It's an open so case. Then, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, um, Charlotte. I, I didn't. The Bradleys answered it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. We're not going to be solving this today. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, even if we pass this, this is not retroactive, is it? Or yeah so um but it brings up a point um any one else wish to speak in support of this bill please um miss faye i i would venture a guess that anybody who wishes to speak is in this room um vicky mccarty had her hand up um and is in the room but Who's that? Vicki McCarty. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't realize. I didn't realize my hand was up. I'm. I'm. I'm going to be testifying on six nine six, and I apologize. No problem. I'll move you back. Uh, you. So we're at the point that anyone who wishes to speak in favor of this bill may speak now. If not, I will go. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition of um, this bill, LD 1070. Hearing none? Anyone? No, there are folks. She's moving excuse them me? over, Senator. Oh, okay, excuse there me. There were people Here. raising their hands in the other. Oh, didn't see that. Um, before I recognize, did I miss anyone? else who would like to speak in support of this bill? I don't see that. I will now ask um, Mr. McKee, do you wish to speak in opposition of this bill? 
I do. Uh, my name is Walt McKee. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And uniquely in this case, I did not know until about 11 minutes ago that this involved an active pending case in which I actually represent the defendant. I was surprised to hear that this was being brought or referenced in connection with their particular case. Uh, and unlike um, others, I'm not going to go into the details of that case other than to indicate to you that there's probably another side of the story. And that's why we have trials and courts to deal with these. And so I would ask that the court or that you all in considering this take into account that this is a pending case. Uh, it has not been resolved and it has not been resolved in large part because of the pandemic and the delays. And so um, I was uh, disappointed um, that this is being brought up in this regard, um, especially in a case that I'm involved in, but I'll separate that out. This is a class D crime. And I think that uh, District Attorney Maloney said it best when she said, I've never seen a court give a, a sentence anywhere near 364 days. And the MACDL has long held to the position that unless and until judges are clamoring to give more punishment above and beyond the class D level, that uh, penalties should not be elevated to the felony level. I'd indicate it all as well that, that this committee has over the past decade moved away from making more crimes uh, felony crimes. In fact, that was the mistakes in our view that were made in the prior decade uh, that required some degree of reversal. With respect to probation, um, I think that uh, Representative Morales indicated best, which is if you want probation, just change the probation statute. But I'd suggest that uh, is a case like this any more qualifying of probation than any other class D, a very significant class D offense involving, as was described, two 30-year-olds uh, is just as uh, worthy of probation or not worthy of probation. In terms of the supervision that probation provides, Maine Pretrial Services offers probation during deferred disposition periods. So there's uh, supervision there as well. Not to mention the fact that nearly every defendant pays to this DA's office and every DA's office $25 as a supervision fee. Something that's going into something uh, we sometimes call um, the non-supervision fee because there isn't supervision. If we're paying for it as defendants, then they should be allowed to get the benefit of that supervision. I'd also indicate that if, with respect to bills um, the, of individuals who are victims of crime, especially those 65 years of age or older, have the opportunity to present those bills to Medicare, which they're entitled to, uh, as well as to, I think, uh, Representative Reckitt correctly indicated, the Victims' Compensation Fund, which is a wonderful fund, is significant, has a lot of money available for individuals just like this. But in terms of the individuals just like this, that is a pending case uh, and really should not be addressed uh, by this committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to address the, this, this important bill. Thank you, Mr. McKee. And I think you probably were in the room when I myself just realized it was a pending case. So, yeah. okay. Um, <clears throat> Anyone else who wished to speak in opposition to this bill? Anyone wishing to speak neither? Oh. Oops, um, Mr. Pelletier. Your hand goes up and you're moving. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Pelletier, you had your hand up. Is this in opposition, sir? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative uh, Warren, members of the committee, John Pelletier, Chair of the Criminal Law Advisory Commission. Uh, I, I wrote testimony and I was prepared to speak on the original bill and, and the, the matter under consideration is not the original bill. <laughs> so I, I, I would like to obviously the Clark folks have not considered the new proposal. But uh, I, in my individual capacity, I think I'd like to offer some, some comments. And first, the first and foremost, I think the legislature has visited this, this area before because for those of you who have uh, your books, uh, if you look on page, uh, if you look on page 187, it talks about judges entering sentences that do not diminish the gravity of the offense. And when it, in what cases in particular do judges need to be concerned about not diminishing the gravity of the offense? Among the factors, the age of the victim, particularly of a victim of advanced age or of young age who has reduced ability to self-protect or who suffers more significant harm due to age. So the legislature has already told judges in the uh, nine purposes of sentencing, 
there are only nine, and there's an A and B, so there's 10 total. And the legislature has already said the judges are to consider if there's advanced age. So, uh, and, and as someone who's been in courts, trust me, the age of a victim is something that is very relevant at every sentencing. Um, regarding the, uh, some of the other things that you've talked about, you could amend the probation statute uh, to, uh, if the legislature were interested, to include an assault on someone over 65. But again, there, there was a wholesale sentencing reform where the decision was made with very few exceptions to eliminate probation for class D and E crimes. And those exceptions have grown, but the rationale was that probation if for, for offenses, what you don't wanna do is impose an intensive remedy where the risk of future offense is not higher because you can actually make the risk of future offense higher. Uh, and uh, and so and and the other thing is that we have a threshold for a class C, and that is serious bodily injury. And convalescence is one part of it, but I apologize for the background noise. But where where the the, the class C charge is available, where the consequences. The legislature has already made clear that it's available where the consequences are serious and rise to the level of serious bodily injury. And I'll stop and be glad to answer any questions. Any questions of Mr. Pelletier? Um, Representative Warren? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. I was, of course, thinking about, um, you know, the changes to misdemeanors if, if somebody thinks that we need probation, but you just said something I haven't heard before. So if you could please say it again, that when the sentencing was restructured or rewritten, we didn't want to put an intensive remedy. Can you say that again? You said it sort of quickly for someone like me who doesn't practice law. There, there's a, there, there's, in, in the study of criminology, uh, th around the time that this change was implemented, there were studies that came out that said that assessed offenders in terms of high risk and low risk and medium risk. And what they, what they found is that if you took a low risk offender and you imposed yes. a high level of intervention you made the low risk offender into a high, a medium or high risk offender. That it was actually bad to take a high level of intervention and impose that on low risk offenders. And the probation and D's and E's, you know, it wasn't a, a fine tune item, but part of the rationale was that, you know, you take someone who is a low risk offender who has a misdemeanor crime and you put him on probation with a whole bunch of conditions that many of us would have difficulty complying with. And you put a probation officer looking at them and that person gets re-involved and re-involved in the criminal justice system. Whereas it, you know, if, if you have low risk offenders and this offender in this case may or may not be a low or high risk offender, I don't know anything, I'm talking in the abstract. But if you have a low risk offender, uh, you, you want to be careful about high high intensity interventions because you can actually uh, cause a low risk offender to become a moderate or higher risk offender. Fascinating. Yeah, that's very it's, good. It's sort of the underlying theme of why we need to stop over policing certain communities. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly that, that, you don't have to comment. I'm not asking you to comment. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, I took notes. Um, 
anyone else have a question of Mr. Pelletier before I move on? Okay. There are two people that have their hand up, um, may have uh, been let into the room a little slower. And so I will ask, are you, Ms. Drew and Ms. Collins, both uh, wishing to testify in support of this bill? No, in opposition. Ms. Drew, uh, which- Opposition. Opposition. Um, all right. Uh, first one is Ms. Drew. Do you wish to make testimony? Yes, thank you. Janet Drew, York, Maine. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and all joint committee members. I, th I just want to say I uh, don't understand all the legalese of um, the lawyer McKee, but I definitely uh, philosophically think that we don't need new laws to put people in jail, that we've really demonstrated over the past several decades that we're very able to put people in jail. The question is, are we able to keep our communities safe? And the one thing that concerned me listening about this law, although it taught probation was discussed, it isn't, again, it's up to the judge and, um, DA to decide if that's an option or not. And my question is, or my concern is that a lot of times it feels like them versus us. You know, the, the people that are making those decisions aren't, li aren't living in the communities and the, and the families that are suffering with the choices and less incarceration can make us safer. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drew. Thank you. Um, Ms. Collins, I, I had, I'm sorry if you saw something in my face. I was going to call you Representative Collins, but go right ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Jan Collins, and I am Assistant Director from Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition. I am here today to speak in opposition to LD1070, an act to make assault on a person 50 years of age or older with a pre existing serious medical condition a Class C crime. MPAC is in sympathy with the sponsor's intent in submitting this bill and to the Bradleys for all that they have suffered. We are equally distressed whenever vulnerable members of our community are hurt in any way. However, we have several concerns about this bill. And this is, these comments are on the original bill. It is difficult to determine a person's age. How would the court establish that a person committing the crime knew the victim's age? Two, likewise with medical conditions, Many medical conditions are not visible to the observer. How would knowledge of a condition be established? Three, what does it mean to have a condition that materially impairs a person? And I think that has been answered. Four, what if there are two people who are over 50 in an altercation, is there still a felony crime? Five, research has shown that threat of punishment is rarely a deterrent to crime increasing the punishment likely will do very little to deter crime or protect vulnerable elders. On principle, may impact is opposed to expanding the criminal code. We already over incarcerate. Seven, we would like to see restorative justice as a way to bring the gravity of the assault to the perpetrator. I am interested in this bill because I was myself assaulted as a teacher in front of a classroom by a young woman who had other issues. Um, I was surprised to hear that generally no jail time is given because she did receive jail time. And I believe from hearing the district attorney that there are plenty of, um, there's plenty of recourse already available under the law to um, deal with this assault. 
Um, I think other things are much more important to us and that includes doing prevention. And that prevention means that we act as a community to explore regular check-ins with adults who are older and to make sure that neighbors and others are aware of someone who may need to have regular check-ins. Again, we respect the great, the good intentions of the sponsor. We respectfully oppose the bill. Thank you for your consideration. I would be glad to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Ms. Collins? Um, so I feel like I've gone through the gamut. Those in support and opposition are neither for nor against. And seeing none, um, before I close this meeting, in work session, I want us to um, really work hard and look at the printed word and less on something that is pending right now. That information is very valuable for us, um, but uh, let's weigh the factors, uh, please. Um, um, all right, I will close the um, bill of uh, the hearing of LD 1070. Thank you. <clears throat> the next um, bill we will review is <clears throat> LD 801. Uh, an act regarding sentencing options for a person convicting, convicted of a crime committed while serving a term of imprisonment. Um, I believe um, Senator Mamon, are you with us there? Welcome. Whoa. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren. Distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, I am Dave Miramont, and I proudly represent all of the people of Appleton, Camden, Free Haven, Cushing, Friendship, Hope, Ilaho, Matinicus, Muscle Ridge Islands, North Haven, Owlshead, Rockland, Rockport, South Thomaston, St. George, Thomaston, Union, Vinyl Haven, and Warren in the Maine Senate. I come before you to present LD801, an act regarding sentencing options for a person convicted of a crime committed while serving a term of imprisonment. When a respected lawyer in my community asked me to put in this bill, my first thought was that I had read it incorrectly, so I reread it several times. I had not misunderstood, and it really did intend to allow for the concurrent serving of time for new crimes perpetrated while someone was incarcerated. Because I was unable to understand how such a system would be a deterrent to an inmate if the opportunity arose to commit a crime, I spoke directly with that lawyer and came to agree that this is necessary. I think most of us have the idea that folk, the folks who would be in a situation of committing another crime when they're already in jail are going to think before acting. Unfortunately, this overlooks the fact that in many cases, our jails and prisons have become a repository for folks with a degree of mental illness that may not allow this level of cognition. We are dealing with that problem at every level of society now. On the front lines, police officers are called to deal with the mentally ill as if they are criminals when what's needed is a healthcare professional who understands how to communicate and de-escalate a situation. In jails and prisons, the same situation occurs with correctional officers taking on the role when they do not have the training that might be helpful or the person they are dealing with cannot understand the issue. This leads us back to this bill. Your committee has been dealing with giving more discretion to judges and prosecutors to pull back from the draconian policies of mandatory minimum sentences. Those policies were hard to watch because they didn't just keep people off the streets who needed to be in prison. They put folks away who had made a few mistakes and until the last never made an effort to defend themselves properly until it was too late. These lessons are the reason for this bill. Their inmates will be brought before judges when they commit an additional offense while they're incarcerated. We need to give these judges and prosecutors who bring the charges a chance to look at the whole picture and determine if more time behind bars at our expense will protect the public or if this is just rote adherence to the law without the wisdom and compassion of an informed judiciary. Please add this tool to the expansion of discretion that we trust our judges to use properly. 
Thank you for your consideration. I'm glad to answer questions if I can. I'll begin by asking you, Senator, I had written a note here. Is there an amendment to this bill? Not from me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't know where I got that. Um, right. Anyone um, wishing to ask the good Senator any questions? Um, Senator, uh, Representative Reckett? Oh, muted, sorry. I like, I like you, Senator DeChambeau, have uh, had a sort of a flashback, like I've heard this somewhere before. Seems to me we had another bill that was similar to this one, and we knew that this one was coming. And I oh. see uh, Representative Pickett shaking his head, yes. So, and also Charlotte, so I mean, uh, Representative Warren. So I believe it was the case. So it was perhaps that one that had an amendment proposed, and I don't remember. I just, re we didn't dispose of it, I don't think. Does anybody remember? No. It's the CLAC Bill 563 that has Section A that deals with this either judicial discretion or not around concurrent sentences. Okay, thank you. Oh. So I have, I have not lost my mind. This is good. Well, I did because that's my bill and I knew there was an amendment. <laughs> As you wish, uh, I, I'm glad that it's being dealt with. And I expected the uh, lawyer who asked me to put it in to be here to testify and made sure that he knew it was happening. But I uh, hope maybe he's there behind the scenes waiting to testify. But however we deal with this or you deal with this is, is good with me. Thank you, Senator. Um. If that's it for questions of Senator Mamoff, thank you. I will ask if anyone wishing to speak in support of this bill. Um, it is. Ms. Fahey, we should have a show of hands and have them come in. So, um, yes, Mr. Pratt. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is Jeremy Pratt. I am the Vice President of MACTL. Uh, MACTL supports LD801. I would also like to thank Senator Merrimont for bringing forth this bill and also special thanks for referring to me as a respected attorney in the community as a criminal defense lawyer, rarely <laughs> referred to as that. So it is a nice change of pace. Um, MACTL continuously supports sentences in criminal cases uh, that are just and are individualized. And in order for sentence to be individualized, judges must have discretion to impose a wide range of potential sentences. Uh, the fairest results come when the court has the widest range of possibilities. And LD801 gives a judge discretion and allows a judge to individualize sentences. It effectively unties a judge's hand. The reason this is so important is a lot of the cases that arise out of the prison, and I practice in Knox County where the main state prison is located, these cases often take a long time to go forward, sometimes multiple years. Uh, I am not sure why the prison and jail cases take so long, but they consistently do. Uh, I have a number of examples that I can give of cases where uh, individuals were serving time at the main state prison and that I've known for maybe five to 10 years. And uh, while at the prison have undergone a transformation of some sort. Years ago, the legislature started a mental health unit at the main state prison. And I'll be honest, I was one of the cynical defense attorneys who thought that the program was simply in order to avoid transferring inmates to Riverview. And I've been pleasantly surprised. There's a doctor named Dr. Fine who's running that program, who's done a phenomenal job. I've seen clients of mine turn around after being entered into that program as if they are completely different individuals. The reason this is so important is you have a person who's crime may have occurred two or three years ago, who have now had two or three years of mental health treatment, and they are required to have a consecutive straight sentence to a sentence they are already serving. 
Uh, I can think of one case where the judge desperately wanted to put this person on probation to get them out into the community, to ease them back into the community since they had been incarcerated so long, and to make sure that they didn't fall off the good path that has been established for them. I want to be absolutely clear. These are minority cases. These are cases that aren't the overwhelming majority, but I think the goal of this committee in this legislature to make sure that there are just results in all cases, not just in the majority of cases. So I, again, thank the committee for considering this bill and thank Senator Merrimont for bringing it forward. I'm happy to answer any questions, but just to clarify, the bill would not just allow for concurrent sentence, it would also allow for probated sentences. So a sentence could be five years all suspended and two years of probation to run consecutive to the sentence that the person is currently serving. That would be allowed if the person is already serving a straight time sentence as opposed to a probated sentence. So I see my time is up. I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions for Attorney Pratt? I would call you a good attorney. Any attorney who follows his client in prison in my book is a good attorney, so thank you. Uh, not that you follow them, but you follow them. Okay, um, Representative Reckitt. I'm sitting here reading the summary of this bill and um, trying to figure out what it means. Because when I read it, it doesn't mean the same thing you just said. And I like what you just said. Okay. So maybe it's just that I don't know the statute that's being repealed. Is that the issue? And um, That is certainly the intent of the bill. And that was the way that I had suggested to Senator Merrimont based on my reading. I know that CLAC has had some concerns with the way that it's being phrased. But I believe that they may suggest an alternative to make sure that that is accomplished. But my reading of the statute is that it would accomplish those goals for it to be a, it wouldn't require a concurrent sentence, but could allow a probated sentence. But just to be clear, it only can be probated in a case where the person is serving a straight time sentence because you can't have a probated sentence to a probated sentence. I hope that's clear. That, that part's clear. Okay. Anyway, I will. Uh try to find my uh, Federico in the, it's a challenge in my office right now. Anybody, anyone else have any questions? The term in that other bill is discretionary. So it sounds pretty much, oh, I, where did I go? I lost Mr. Pratt, there he is in the corner. Um, okay. Um, anyone else wish to give testimony in support of um, LD801? I don't see anyone. Anyone wishing to... Uh, uh, Ms. Collins has her hand up, Madam Chair. I was wondering, I, I'm trying to get it going. I thought everybody's in the room. So if we're all in the room, um, yes, uh, Ms. Collins, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Jan Collins and I'm Assistant Director from Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition. And I am here to speak in favor of LD801. And I'll confess, that I did not prepare written testimony because like um, Representative Reckitt, I wasn't really sure what the bill was saying. It was a really long sentence that made up an entire paragraph that um, described the bill. And I wanted to be sure that I was testifying on the right side. So here I am. Um, this bill does a couple of things that we look for when we're in sporting bills. One, it allows for judicial discretion. One of the most important things we can do is allow the judge to actually use their training to make a decision about sentencing. Secondly, it addresses the issue of mental illness. As we all know from being on this committee for this session and for many people many years, 
there is a huge number of people in our prison system who have mental illness, many of whom are untreated or undertreated. Any bill that helps to take into consideration mental illness and having very good treatment for mental illness is important to fairness in sentencing. So with that, impact is in favor of this bill and hope that you will give it your full support. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Collins? Seeing none. Um, anyone else in opposition? Seeing none. Anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against? Senator, I'm bringing people over. It just takes like three seconds for each one. So there's a delay. You know, after three months, I should get it right. Whoa, here we go. All right. Um, greetings, Sheriff Mason. Um, Good afternoon. Um, am I, is this, oh, a little bit. Are you all um, here to speak in opposition of this bill? Okay, and fine. Um, well, the first one I saw was uh, Sheriff Mason. Uh, Mr. Pelletier, and then uh, Ms. Ms. Black. So we begin with um, with you, sir, Mr. Mason, Sheriff. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Ken Mason, and I am the Sheriff here in Kennebec County. And today I am here on behalf of the Maine Sheriff's Association uh, Maine sheriffs, we all met, we discussed this bill, and it was our unanimous position to oppose LD-801. You know, we as Maine sheriffs were aligned with the intent of providing our inmates with humane care and assistance in areas to ensure their success upon release from our jails. We provide medical care that is often not available to these citizens. We create pathways to overcome substance abuse and we ensure that they are well-fed and in reasonably comfortable accommodations. Compared to many of the situation that they may be facing outside of our facility, they know that they are safe in our care. Should LD-801 pass through this committee and eventually be signed into law, the unintended consequence of this action is putting the public incarcerated individuals and our staff members in harm's way. It is undeniable that there are good people who have made poor choices. Occasionally, these individuals find themselves in our corrections communities. No one in this discussion would dispute that there are also people who struggle to make proper choices. If we, as a society, ought to remove ramifications to those who could jeopardize other inmates and staff members, we have failed those incarcerated persons who expect and deserve protection. Now, we cannot ignore the other pressing concern that you are all aware of are staffing our correctional facilities. The men and the women we employ are often not paid enough for their strenuous work. They manage the most difficult populations and they come back to work day after day. This scenario is consistent in all main counties. If we remove the sanction of non-concurrent sentencing, those inmates who violate have nothing to lose by committing another crime. The MDOC standard allows for inmate discipline, which is how the vast majority of rule violations they are addressed. Those crimes that result in charges are generally, they're only the most significant and harmful violations. To remove the ability to charge offenders of these devastating crimes without a doubt, very dangerous decision. Members of this committee, 
We have repeatedly heard from both sides, state and county officials of the devastating impact of smuggling drugs into the facilities. In view of this fact, please remember that those inmates who are desperately working to overcome addiction, who may be damaged or even overdosed while in jail. Please know that we understand and respect the thought process behind 801. When the time comes that we no longer find smuggling drugs and contraband into our jails, physical or sexual assault of inmates, or any one of the medrid of ways that people can be harmed, perhaps this bill could be re-examined. Until that time, we as the main sheriffs unanimously urge you to vote ought not to pass. Thank you for your consideration, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions for Sheriff Mason? Seeing none, again, thanks. Um, Thank you. Mr. Pelletier. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, uh, Representative Warren, members of the committee. I'm John Pelletier. I'm the chair of the Criminal Law Advisory Commission. Uh, the CLAC uh, has been discussing this issue, and we are in favor of the discretion that Senator uh, Merrimack and uh, Attorney Pratt were arguing for. Our concern about this bill is that in, an, in most cases, it eliminates the judge's discretion. Because what, what happens, I've said to the, the committee before, you cannot have a sentence of incarceration that's consecutive to a split sentence. Most people in prison are on split sentences. What 1609 allows, there's a procedure in 1609 that allows, because you can't put the new, the additional sentence on the end because the person has a split sentence, you can interrupt the first sentence, insert the new sentence, and then when that is completed, the first sentence picks up again. The only place in law where that process is authorized is in 1609. So, what, uh, so effectively, if 1609 were simply repealed, then anybody who's in a prison or jail serving a split sentence who commits a new crime and is found guilty while they're still in prison or jail, cannot be sentenced to a consecutive sentence. They can't get, they have to get a concurrent sentence. They can't get an additional, they could get an additional fine, but they can't get an additional jail time. So what Clack will be proposing, what we've settled on as the way to resolve part A of the Clack bill is a mechanism that allows the judge's discretion. The judge can order a concurrent sentence. If attorney Pratt can convince the judge that's the just result in, in this case or a case, then the judge can order a concurrent sentence. But if the judge decides, I want to impose additional jail time on this person who is serving a split sentence, you need to maintain the mechanism where they can interrupt the first sentence and insert the additional jail time. And if you wholesale repeal 1609, that mechanism goes away. So to preserve discretion on both ends, you need to preserve the ability to insert a non-concurrent sentence, but also give the judge the discretion to decide on the individual facts and circumstances whether the new sentence is gonna be concurrent or non-concurrent, that's up to the judge. But if the judge decides they need a non-concurrent sentence, they need a mechanism to be able to impose that. And if the person is serving a split sentence, you need that mechanism of interrupting the current sentence and imposing the additional jail time in before the first sentence finishes. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I hope I tried, I hope that's somewhat clear. <clears throat> We've all heard that for the past three weeks, well, yeah. a dozen times. Um, so, uh, any questions of Mr. Pelletier? Seeing none, um, 
I will recognize Anna Black. Oops, I, yeah, I, I see a hand. Um, Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Pelletier, just real quickly. Uh, this bill here, if I'm correct, this is the one that is, a, is dealt with in your CLAC bill that Senator DeChambeau uh, put forward for you. Is that correct? That's right. We deal with 1609. And, and in fact, we've you asked us to take a look at it again, and we have. And the proposal we're supporting uh, is for there to be discretion to do it either way, concurrent so then, or not concurrent. So then if... If we were to do what you just suggested, we could do it in 16.0, and we could do it in the CLAC bill as part of that bill, and this bill would not would not be necessary. Is that correct? That's that's correct. If that's where the, the direction you want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Black. You wish thank to you. provide testimony? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and other distinguished members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, I'm Anna Black, Director of Government Affairs for the DOC, providing testimony in opposition to 801 on behalf of Commissioner Liberty. Um, much of what I have to say is repetitive to what Mr. Pelletier said, but I will provide it just to give the department's perspective. Uh, the MDOC is concerned about the negative impact this bill will have on staff, on residents, and property. As we've heard, the bill seeks to repeal Title 17A, Section 1609. So if enacted, it would mean that many of those serving the split sentence would not be held accountable if they committed a new crime while incarcerated. Repealing the statute would eliminate the ability of a court to impose a non-concurrent sentence when a resident of a DOC adult facility commits the new crime during imprisonment. Uh, as John Pelletier, excuse me, as Mr. Pelletier mentioned, the non-concurrent sentence really interrupts the sentence already being served so that the new sentence can begin immediately. If the bill passed, the court would only be able to impose on someone serving a split sentence, a concurrent sentence for a new crime during imprisonment. The non-concurrent sentence is a sentence, of course, as we all know, that runs at the same time as the sentence being served. Um, so passing this would mean that a resident who commits a new crime, including a resident who assaults staff or another resident, traffics drugs, destroys state's property, or commits sexual violence while serving their time would not be given a meaningful sentence for this crime, simply because it's happening within the correctional facility. So the MDOC is particularly concerned that repealing the statute would impact the security of the facility and the safety of the persons within it. So it could increase the risk of assault on staff, could increase the risk of assault on residents. We feel pretty strongly that it would also result in an increase in drug trafficking and other crimes because the resident committing the crimes would have no reason to be concerned about further punishment. Uh, Non-concurrent sentencing, uh, which results in more imprisonment time, tends to be an effective deterrent for committing or attempting to commit new crimes while incarcerated, and we don't believe this should be eliminated. Uh, Commissioner Liberty and other staff, other necessary staff are happy to be at the work session when it gets scheduled. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Black? I think, uh, and I'm not gonna speak for the department, but I'd like us to all think though a split sentence is a sentence um you can't insert something consecutive you have to do that whole sentence um or as this provides or the other bill provides you stop it so um i don't see anyone um anyone uh, speak Neither for nor against um, LD 801. Seeing none, I will call this public hearing 801 uh, to a close. Thank you. And, um, the work session, uh, Senator Mamwan, is um, April 12th, next week. Okay, see you then. Thank you. Thank you, bye.
Okay. I feel we're in prison. Jeepers. <laughs> and let's talk about solitary confinement. Um, the next spill is um, LD696, an act to prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's corrections system. And um, our very own um, Representative Lipna, that's his bill. So, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable colleagues on the Committee of Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Grayson Luckner, and I represent part of Portland. I'm here today to present LD 696, an act to prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's correction system. We have a Department of Corrections in the state of Maine. To me, that implies that as a state, we work to correct the behavior of those who have been convicted of crimes who become residents of the state's jails and prisons and rehabilitate them to functioning behavior in society. We do not have a department of senseless punishment nor a department of psychological torture in the state. By any name, restrictive housing, administrative segregation or solitary confinement, the practice of holding inmates in isolation for weeks, months and oftentimes years on end amounts to senseless punishment and psychological torture. As former Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy put it succinctly, solitary confinement literally drives men mad. For those who have been left languishing in isolation, the scenes are frequently gruesome. Blood mixes with vomit, feces, and other bodily fluids on the facility's floors and other surfaces as residents engage in self-harming behavior and a plea for transfer to a facility's mental health unit. The trauma from being locked up in solitary for prolonged periods is lasting and does not restore residents to a state of functioning, either in prison or out. In the words of one former warden of the Maine State Prison, to paraphrase, you can put someone in solitary for five years, but I don't want to be living next to them when they get out. In many instances, even the most heinous crimes are driven by underlying mental illness and behavioral health disorders. Solitary confinement only exacerbates these symptoms and creates human beings who will be charges of the state for a much longer period than they would have been otherwise. The state's Department of Corrections mission states that they use evidence-based practices and follow the National Institute of Corrections best evidence-based practices. The NIC's own literature on solitary confinement makes no mention that this practice has any evidence backing it, and indeed cites that the major reason that it has become such a common practice is due to overcrowding in our prisons. In fact, all the studies that have been done on the practice show that it is linked to worse behavior, higher rates of psychosis, and suicide. Solitary confinement was infrequently used in the United States prior to 1980. We have seen populations of prisons grow exponentially in that period, including in Maine. The reduced populations we have in Maine's DOC currently because of the pandemic presents a unique opportunity for us to start thinking differently about how we do corrections. With lower populations, there shouldn't be a need for solitary confinement at all. This bill needs some refining in order to cover all of the DOC's practices to ensure that it prevents the worst psychological torment from being inflicted on our prisons, in our prisons. The Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution prevents cruel and unusual punishment from being inflicted on our nation's prisoners. In my view, this practice not only violates that provision, it also makes us less safe by inflicting unnecessary trauma on our state's inmates. I look forward to working with you all to craft a bill that ends this practice in the state of Maine. Thank you for hearing my testimony and I will do my best to answer any questions. Any questions of Representative Lichter? It, um, Representative Lichter, did you do research of what like the policy currently is or um um you know i kind of i i've looked into it a bit um 
you know, I think there are other people on this call who can answer that better, kind of what the, the policies are when it comes to the state, uh, the DOC. Okay. Seeing no other questions, I will ask if there is um, anyone in the waiting room wishing to come in and speak on this bill. I'll wait for you. I see nine people and supposedly 28 people are participating. Okay, here we go. Um, we uh, are at the point of asking people if they wish to speak in support of this bill. Anyone wishing to speak okay? I have Zachary Hayden or Helden. I'm sorry, Hayden, right? <laughs> okay, look like an L. I will recognize you, sir. You may uh, present your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, distinguished members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, my name is Zach Hayden. I am Chief Counsel at the ACLU of Maine, and I'm here today delivering testimony in support of LD 696 on behalf of the ACLU of Maine, as well as on behalf of Maine Transnet, um, GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders, GLAD, and Equality Maine. I uh, wanna thank uh, the sponsor, Representative Lichner, for bringing forward this important uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and we hope that it will receive your, your due consideration I wanna just provide a little bit of background that there was, and I'm not sure how many of the members of this committee were around the last time that this committee took up the issue of um, solitary confinement reform approximately 11 years ago, uh, but it was a, a long uh, discussion and ultimately the Maine legislature did not uh, adopt legislation to restrict the use of solitary confinement at that time but motivated and inspired, I think, by much of the testimony and the discussion that was generated through that process, the Maine Department of Corrections did take it upon itself to pass substantial restrictions uh, on the use of solitary confinement and has substantially reduced the use of solitary confinement in its facilities. Uh, that is something they deserve enormous credit for, but there is still um, a lot of room for improvement. There's still a lot of, a lot, that can be done. And there is a role for the main legislature to play in pushing for those reforms and in making sure that the protections against solitary confinement, which is a horrendous and inhumane practice, uh, are more aware, or the public is more aware of those restrictions and that the public is better able to enforce those protections. So we think that is the, the most important reason why uh, this committee and the legislature should adopt restrictions in statute. Um, the state of New York just last week uh, adopted the Halt Solitary Confinement Act, which is the most uh, far reaching restriction on the use of solitary confinement that was signed into law uh, by Governor Cuomo and Maine needs to regain its position as the leader in the country in restricting the use of solitary confinement and bringing us closer to the day when solitary confinement is ended as a practice in our corrections facilities. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Hyde, Mr. Hyden, do, is there a definition of solitary confinement that maybe the department is using that I'm unaware of or how, what is that? The, the department, as far as I'm aware, the Department of Corrections does not have a definition of solitary confinement. And you, I'm sure are going to hear from somebody from the Department of Corrections, but I think it is their position that the 
the practices in their special management unit do not constitute um, solitary confinement. But other entities, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, uh, have come up with definitions of solitary confinement. Uh, I think, you know, rather than getting into the semantics of, of what where the line is in terms of so, this is solitary confinement and this isn't, I think the key is to think about the, the purposeful de deprivation of meaningful human contact. Uh, and that's something that has been shown to have uh, terrible health and mental health effects on people and looking at ways of, of reducing and ultimately eliminating that. Uh, and, and to the extent that it's being used, making sure that there are robust due process protections in place for people. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Um, I thank then you, saw um, Tina Natto. Um, I will recognize Ms. Natto followed by Han Hannah Longley. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau and thank you members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tina Natto and I think I am the fourth MACTL person before you today. I am the executive director of MACTL and I'm here to testify in support of the concept of LD 696 um, and thank Representative Luckner for presenting this extremely important bill. Um, there's been some discussion behind the scenes that um, I think would result in a much more robust and wide sweeping bill um, that this bill be carried over into the short session to allow stakeholders a chance to review the current policies that were implemented by DOC approximately a decade ago and see where improvements can be made. I think it's also important to note that it's beyond DOC, it's also to include the jails in this state um, and what policies and procedures are employed by the jails um, where too many of my clients are languishing right now. Um, we look forward to working with the other stakeholders, particularly the main prisoners advocacy coalition um, who have worked on issues regarding solitary confinement probably longer than anyone else on this call um, in crafting a bill that will protect incarcerated people, uh, especially young people, vulnerable people, pregnant people, and as we've heard, people who are struggling with mental illness or in a mental health crisis um, from the devastating effects of solitary confinement for both short and long periods. Um, the policies and procedures that have been promulgated by the Department of Corrections are voluminous and they must be reviewed in light of actual practice in each facility. Um, in light of monumental legislation in places like Massachusetts and the response of GOC there, and most recently in New York, as alluded to by Attorney Hyden, it is important and imperative to take lessons from the passage of such legislation and how progress is made in implementing these changes there and how they could be implemented here. So um, I'd like to thank the committee for their attention. And I think this is an important issue that we're going to hear and we should be hearing a lot more about in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Natto? I'll help you, Ms. Addo. The policy was revised uh, last July, but you are correct. I think it goes back about 18 years. And um, so um, I I'm totally in favor of revisions and reviews. So, um, so no questions. I will now ask Hannah Longley for her testimony, please. Good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I'm Hannah Longley, and I represent NAMI, Maine. As the state's largest grassroots mental health advocacy organization, NAMI, Maine supports the passage of an act to prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's correction system. Solitary confinement has been researched extensively and has been found to have profound negative impacts on an individual's mental and physical health as well as detrimental impacts on the rehabilitative goals set forth by our criminal justice system. It has also been found to increase the likelihood of future discord and escalation of behaviors that could lead to dangerous situations for both the individuals and the corrections officers. Solitary confinement has been found to increase or exacerbate mental health symptoms. These symptoms include anxiety and stress, 
depression, problems with concentration and memory, as well as increasing the risk for symptoms of psychosis and suicidal ideation. Although solitary confinement is typically utilized in terms of containment of behaviors or impunitive measures, it has been found to increase anger and irritability, decrease impulse control, and increase the risk for possible violent outbursts. By utilizing solitary confinement, the correction setting is actually increasing the risk for the very reason that the person was placed in it in the first place. Due to these significant mental health concerns and responses, <laughs> solitary confinement disrupts the very goals of our correction systems when utilized in any way. Solitary confinement is a correctional tactic and behavior containment strategy that has been utilized for hundreds of years. However, it's now outdated and the research clearly indicates the detrimental impacts it has on the individual's mental health and cognitive abilities. The strategy perpetuates and exacerbates patterns of disruptive and at times aggressive behaviors, creating an unsafe place for all who are in it. Solitary confinement also negatively impacts any progress individuals have made in order to participate in the rehabilitation and treatment of behavior patterns and mental health symptoms. Because of this, NAMI Maine strongly urges you to protect both the inmates and the corrections officers in prohibiting the use of solitary confinement. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Ms. Longley? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else that wishes to speak in support. I will now ask anyone wishing to speak in opposition. Uh, Ms. Fahey, are there any other? Uh, I mean, there are four hands up. I think maybe if their camera's not on, you can't see them for some reason. Could everyone who wants to speak turn your camera? I have Cheryl Mills, Mark Joyce. Uh, okay. I will begin again. We asked uh, those in support, and now I am up. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Joyce, for raising your hand. Who else wishes to speak in support of this bill? Lori Swain. I didn't hear. Lori I'm... Swain. Cheryl Mills. Okay. Um, I will. McCarty. Okay. I will recognize um, Mr. Joyce, followed by. I don't see the name. I think I'll go with um, Mr. Joyce, followed by Miss Mills, I believe. Okay, so Mr. Joyce, please begin. Yes, Thank uh, you. Yes, hello, uh, uh, Senator Shambo, Representative Warren, and the distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Mark Joyce. I'm a managing attorney of Disability Rights Maine. We're Maine's protection advocacy organization for individuals with disabilities. Um, and uh, I just want to echo what uh, the other individuals who have testified regarding this particular bill. We support it very strongly and, and support the, uh, the concept of uh, what Ms. Nada was talking about in terms of looking at the, the current situation and, and you know, having the stakeholders come together with a very thorough review. I think one of the things that I don't think anybody can argue with is just the, the fact that this should not be happening. This, this should not be happening to anybody. And that it's a, um, uh, if you look at the literature and you look at the case law, and I won't, I, I won't go on too long because I, I'm repeating a lot of what other people have said, but even in the case law, you will see a sort of commonality amongst um, courts that talk about just the detrimental nature of, of uh, solitary confinement in individuals. And so one of the, I'll just read a quote from a, a Third Circuit case, which I think really encapsulates it from a uh, Williams uh, uh, versus uh, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. And it, it, the quote is, we observed a growing consensus with roots going back a century that conditions like those to which Brandon, that was the name of the inmate, repeatedly was subjected can cause severe and traumatic psychological damage, including anxiety, panic, paranoia, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, psychosis, and even a disintegration of the basic sense of self-identity. And the damage done does not stop at mental harm. 
Physical harm can also result. Studies have documented high rates of suicide and self-mutilation amongst inmates who have been subjected to solitary confinement. These behaviors are believed to be maladaptive mechanisms for dealing with psychological suffering that comes from isolation. So I would just echo what all the other uh, individuals who spoke and, and really uh, agree with Mr. Hyden that we should really move towards ending this particular sort of intervention um, uh, just in total. So that would be my uh, testimony for today. Thank you. Uh, any members of the committee have questions of Mr. Joyce? Seeing none, I will go to Cheryl Mills, followed by Lori Swain. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Cheryl Dearman Mills. I live in Wells. And today I will be reading testimony written by a former resident of the Maine State Prison, Norman Kelling, and he is in support of LD 696. His letter states, Dear Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, Representative Luckner, and honorable com committee members, thank you for your service to the state of Maine. I am here to support doing away with solitary confinement in Maine as the title of LD 696 states. I spent more than five years in solitary confinement in Maine State Prison in both Thomaston and Warren. During my time in segregation, I witnessed dozens, if not to say hundreds of horrors. I saw men that were so terrified of the isolation, the lack of contact and movement, the deprivation of sensory experience, that they sought to remedy their fears by severely harming themselves or by taking their own feces and bodily fluids and flinging them into their own and others' spaces and faces, sometimes by flooding corridors and hallways. On at least two occasions, men handed their own cutoff testicles to nurses, prison guards. I heard the nurse scream. I heard the gruesome noises of a man with severe mental illness run at the door of his cell and hit his head so many times that he developed a permanent large callus on his head. Mike James, a well-known case. And to say that cells were quite regularly bathed in blood from the men whose mental illness was that of cutting themselves is no overstatement. Those that guard inmates fall into two essential categories with many subcategories. There are the guards who are there to do their jobs honorably and correctly. The second category is the guard who feels that inmates are not punished severely enough by incarceration and the ensuing deprivations. That category of guard feels that it is his, her job to punish inmates further with minor and major abuses of power constant clattering of nightsticks on cages while men are attempting to sleep, pushing and literally pounding men to minor infractions, like having an apple in your cell or an extra wrapper of sugar or swearing in response to being left without toilet paper or a pencil for days at a time that then result in longer times spent in isolation. Segregation in and of itself is torture Though its original intent was to improve the chances of inmates to self-reflect and even to repent, unfortunately, that is not what happens. There is much evidence to support the fact that long-term isolation severely increases anxiety, depression, despair, mental instability, hopelessness, and instances of acting out early trauma and childhood violence. I want to thank and commend both Commissioner Liberty who as warden of the main state prison and current warden Magnuson for doing their best to initiate and follow policies and procedures. I know from hard won experience that what Maine is doing in regard to solitary confinement is not working. There is another way. Please act humanely and decisively to prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's corrections system. Thank you again for your service to Maine Norman Kelling, Swanville, Maine. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Mills? 
Thank you. I now will um, call up uh, Laurie Swain. If, is yes. there anyone else that wishes to speak following Ms. Swain? If you please- I have, my hand, I have my hand up, Vicki McCarty. Oh, okay. Um, after Ms. Swain, we will recognize you, Ms. McCarty. Thank you. Ms. Swain? Yes, can you hear me okay? We are fine. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, my name is Lori Swain and I live in Cape Elizabeth. I am here today to speak in favor of LD 696, an act to prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's correction system. However, I'm asking for the language of the bill to be strengthened so that it would be better able to achieve the goal in its title. What I can tell you about solitary confinement is that it's pure torture. My son, Zachary Swain went to Maine State Prison in December 2015. He was a senior in high school and he has suffered from bipolar disorder, severe anxiety, depression, PTSD, and he has high functioning autism. He's been on medication most of his life because we found that he wasn't able to function well without it. He had a one-on-one -on -one aid during his high school years and during his school years and was in special education with an IEP. Since being incarcerated in 2015, we've tried to work with Cumberland County Jail and Maine State Prison to provide proper medication to Zach. Maine State Prison chose to instead put him in solitary confinement. They use various names for it, but it's all solitary confinement. He is on some meds now, but they make him very drowsy. He has, and in fact, they just changed his meds um, again. <laughs> and so um, Zach has spent over four years in solitary confinement and is still there now. He has been targeted by corrections officers relentless in their harassment. They tell Zach that they are spitting in his food. They've threatened to harm his 13 year old sister. They've withheld mail. They take everything out of his room, so he sits in a room with nothing at all, all day long. They forced him and two other inmates naked, handcuffed and shackled to march through several pods in front of four female employees, male employees and inmates, including sex offenders. The COs have pepper sprayed him, put him in a restraining chair, tasered him and beat on him several times a week when he was suffering mentally. Zach began swallowing metal and other objects and had emergency surgery several times this past year. This fall, he hung himself twice. One night he was found hanging and unconscious in his cell and was taken to the hospital in a coma. All the blood vessels in his head and eyes were purple and he couldn't stand up without help. His gross motor skills were affected. He his arms dropped when he tried to reach for things. When he returned from the hospital, instead of being taken to the infirmary per hospital discharge orders, he was taken to a room and beat up by two COs. From there, he was taken to a freezing cold room covered with urine and feces with only a suicide vest, barefoot and begging for a blanket, which they never gave him. He had to sleep on the floor. The next day he had to scrape the feces off his feet. He had bruises all over his body and couldn't stand or sit up straight. He wasn't seen by medical until two weeks later when Rick Liberty told him he had a severe traumatic brain injury that would take months to heal. He does not remember the assault. He learned the details from a copy of the write-up. When he cut his arm after the suicide attempt, they pepper sprayed him, tased him, and put him in a restraint chair. He was wearing only a suicide vest dripping with pepper spray and boxers. He had to sit with his face and privates burning in that chair for 23 hours. He was pepper sprayed a total of 10 times that week after his severe head trauma. Since childhood, Zach's disability qualified him for the Katie Beckett program. The state website describes that program as a main care program that provides medical coverage for children living at home with long-term disabilities 
or complex medical needs. A child must also be disabled by social security disability standards and require a level of care typically provided in a psychiatric hospital, nursing facility, or group home. We have continually asked for mental health services consistent with his disability. The nurses and doctors told him he should be in the intensive mental health unit because they are trained to disescalate situations and they have programming that would be helpful to Zach. The people at the top denied him. They wouldn't give us a reason, but uh, Zach was told by uh, medical personnel that it was because he was too intelligent. So he sits in ACU, otherwise known as solitary confinement until his release next February. Please help me save my son. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Swain. Any questions of Ms. Swain? Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question. I just wanna thank you, Ms. Swain. It's tough to share that and I can't imagine what it's like to be a mom of a child going through such difficulties. So I just needed to say that. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, and thank you. We will have now, uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, I will now call up uh, Ms. McCarthy, Ms. Ms. McCarty, I, should, I believe. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Senator DeChambeau and Representative Warren. My name is Vicki McCarty, and I'm a policy analyst for the Consumer Council System of Maine. And I'm here today on behalf of the CCSM to testify in support of LD 696, which is an act to provide, uh, prohibit solitary confinement in Maine's correctional system. I wanna let you know that, that our organization is made up of, of folks who advocate for mental health issues. Um, and we also, all of our members and staff have, have had or have uh, mental health issues. And many of our members have also seen the inside of correctional facilities. So, but we wanna say thanks to the hard work of many main uh, citizens, legislators and state personnel we are making progress towards integrating a correctional system that embraces jail diversion, positive reentry, rest uh, restorative justice and peer support programs in lieu of perpetuating punitive actions that do harm. And although there has been some movement to address the issue of solitary confinement, it has not been enough. And so I'd like to kind of echo what, you know, what others have said before me in terms of some research that they have provided and personal testimonies. And I have, I have also included some research. And I would just like to say that uh, the Commissions on Safety and Abuse in America's Prisons uh, says what happens inside jails and prisons does not stay inside jails and prisons. It comes home with prisoners after they are released and with corrections officers at the end of each day at their shift. When people live and work in facilities that are unsafe, unhealthy, unproductive, or inhumane, they carry the effects home with them. We must create safe and productive conditions of confinement, not only because it is the right thing to do, but because it influences the safety, health, and prosperity of us all. So again, we support the overall premise of this bill. However, it needs to be strengthened, especially in the area of human contact in order to be most effective. To that extent, we ask that the bill be carried over as to allow more time to further the work on the bill. And, uh, and if there is an amendment presented, we would like to support that. We would urge you to consider that option as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. McCarty. Um, any questions of Ms. McCarty? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else wish to speak in support of the bill? I don't see any. Anyone uh, wish to speak in opposition of the bill? I don't see anyone. 
step up. Anyone wishing to speak, neither for nor against? Um, Commissioner Liberty, welcome. Thank you. Senator Chambor, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the um, Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am Randall Liberty. I'm the Commissioner of Maine Department of Corrections, providing testimony neither for nor against this bill. The Maine Department of Corrections supports this, the spirit of this bill as it aligns with national best practices and aligns our, with our philosophy and practices to seek the least restrictive housing options for residents in our care. In January of this year, Representative Luckner met with my staff to discuss MDOC's policies, procedures related to restrictive housing. They discussed the MDOC's policies prohibit the use of solitary confinement, discussed the statute regarding segregation, which we refer to as restrictive housing, and they discussed the reasons for the Department of Corrections resident would be placed in restrictive housing. This includes either disciplinary reasons for having been found guilty of a major disciplinary violation after due process hearing, or administrative reasons as an example, a resident in direct threat to himself of, of himself or another person, if in less restrictive housing. Their conversation also covered the significant strides this department has made related to this topic, which includes an overhaul of policies, accountability of staff, increased programming during periods of restrictive housing, and uh, Maine is progressive, Maine's progressive steps away from the practices like solitary confinement and increased programming and contact during periods of restrictive restriction have been recognized nationally by the Vera Institute of Justice and others included the Lyman Center for Public Interest at the Yale Law School. This national recognition is in part the significant work that the department has done to reduce the use of restrictive housing. We've achieved a 72% reduction in restrictive housing placements in 2015. We recognize the best way to reduce the need for restrictive housing is to ensure residents are engaged in pro-social activities. Not surprisingly, as we've increased educational offerings, job training programs, wellness programs, including yoga and agro management and increased restorative justice practices, we've seen a decrease in assaults, harassment, victimization, destruction of property, which would typically result in the use of disciplinary restrictive housing. As this committee knows, we have consistently opened our doors to, of the DOC facilities to lawmakers, advocates, and others interested in, in better understanding all areas of corrections, including restrictive housing. I will continue to make my staff and the facilities available for the, for, as it is useful to this topic. We look forward to engaging with the sponsor and the committee in the work session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, I'll open up for questions and I see Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here this afternoon. After listening to uh, a mother of a former inmate or a person reading testimony in of a former inmate and a mother of an incarcerated son uh, with autism and other, and other problems, uh, Commissioner, and very disturbing hearing both of those stories in regards to things that, that were alleged to have happened and are happening to, uh, to both inmate them in the case of the former inmate to the inmate himself and others he witnessed and the, uh, the son of the uh, person who uh, with autism, the son with autism who was in form incarcerated at this time. So I guess the question I have for you, sir, uh, what, if any of these have happened on your watch and what has been done, what has been done to try to correct the issue if in fact it has been, without getting into personnel complaints and that kind of stuff, but what has been done on your behalf to uh, see to it that these things, if they are happening, are, do not continue to happen? Thank you, Representative, that's a good question. Uh, these are very um, you know, difficult topics for family members and others involved in the process. And I do not want to minimize in any way um, the emotion that's attached to incarceration for a family member. As we know, incarceration is a family affair and is very, very difficult uh, to discuss. And um, I won't get any, in, into any specifics, but the three years that I spent as warden, I was intimately engaged in, in many of these 
um, with many of these residents, um, this did not um, fairly represent my observations during um, you know, some of these described events. And so um, again, very difficult to, to talk about, but there are multiple versions of some of these stories. Some of the testimony you've heard may have resulted in, in uh, occurrences or um, incidents that occurred long ago and um, do not reflect what's happening today. And so, as I've mentioned, we've had a reduction in, in almost 73% um, in just since 2015. In 2015, myself and Dr. Ryan Thornell traveled to the National Institute of Corrections and, uh, in, in Colorado, and we were engaged in a week-long program um, sponsored by the, by the uh, Department of Justice to reduce restrictive housing, the, the reliance on restrictive housing, and upon return as warden and as Dr. Thornell here as the, as the deputy commissioner, um, we aggressively pursued the reduction in the, the use of, of that. I look forward uh, to bringing any member of this uh, committee, uh, as I have brought many to you, of you, to a restrictive housing uh, environment. Um, currently, we have uh, less than eight, on average, we have less than eight individuals that are in administrative status, eight of the 1,700. Um, their average length of stay for males is 6.7 days, 6.7 days in, in that administrative status. And for female residents, it's uh, 1.75 individuals engaged in this, uh, in this activity. So I would just like to um, state that I'm very interested in working on this with all stakeholders um, to bring the data, um, look at what's happening nationally, and to be a true partner in any way we can to reduce our use of restrictive housing. Thank you. Um, follow up, please. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner, so uh, I was hoping to see somebody here to, that would be testifying from the uh, county jails. I do not see anybody on the list, at least not the one I'm looking at. So that being said, I know that you were a former sheriff in charge of a uh, correctional facility there as well. And uh, I wanted to ask the question to somebody, if there would have been somebody here about an active sheriff at the time, do the jails, it's been mentioned that the jails use solitary confinement as well as the, as the DOC. And is that, is that true? And uh, just, so I, just so I can compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Thank you, Representative. And we have um, spoken with the Maine Sheriff's Association on this matter. Um, I believe they they um, they can speak for themselves, but the um, as sheriff and as chief for about 14 years total, um, it's a, as you know, county corrections is different. It's sort of the emergency room of the of corrections. People come in uh, recently arrested, um, sometimes under the influence. Uh, the world has changed, and it's it can be very um, transitional. And um, I, although they don't officially use um, restrictive housing. Um, it's, I see that uh, Sheriff Mason's here, so he may want to speak on behalf of the main sheriffs um, regarding that question. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to make sure that we got a, a well-rounded view of, of yes. this situation. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, Representative Pickett, would you want Sheriff Mason to weigh in on that? Oh, are we, you muted yourself. <laughs> yes, if he, uh, if he's called on at some point or if you want to call on him now, whatever the proper procedure is, that would be nice to hear his, uh, his comment. Uh, Sheriff Mason. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the MSA. I'm going to speak on behalf of myself. And, and Commissioner Liberty uh, really um, spoke the truth with us. This is a very difficult thing for families having to go through, uh, you know, an incarceration with a family member. And uh, having been there myself, I understand it. Uh, we as sheriffs, you know, we don't have uh, segregation units, if you, if you will. Uh, a, a person may receive a disciplinary action and be locked down within his own or her own block uh, for a period of time. The, there is 
they continuously have contact with our staff as well as other inmates can talk with them through the doors and they have an hour out. Um, we, I haven't experienced any of that uh, type of behavior since I've been sheriff um, and certainly it would never be condoned. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, Senator Sirway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess this is kind of a, a question to both uh, the commissioner and the sheriff, because I know that two different facilities, but um, I just was asking how policy has changed through the years because of what we have for resources. I, don't, I remember AMHI days when they would come and evaluate the the, the person and then decide whether they could go to the am high or not. And if they couldn't, they'd have to keep them there until they decided saying, well, uh, he met the threshold and then get back. And I don't know what kind of, um, I mean, times, the policies changed because of resources. I guess that's the question. Uh, what, what do you think about that? And I just wondering if this bill would not give the, the option of the policy change. Thank you, Senator. Um, yes, as you mentioned, it, it, two different sort of uh, correctional models. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the jails have a, have a very heavy lift and heavy responsibility taking those new intakes and it's a very challenging transitional time. Um, the prison system, the main department of corrections has a more stable population. We have the luxury of that. Um, I feel as though um, we do have the resources available to make those assessments. When someone's placed in a restrictive housing environment, there are follow-ups that are done in, within 72 hours uh, with mental health and with the, the leadership team and multidisciplinary teams to determine um, if they should be they should remain in, in restrictive housing. Most often, individuals in restrictive housing um, in my facilities, and I think in the jails also, it may be an assault on staff. It could be an assault on another uh, another um, uh, resident. There could be some major disciplinary uh, infraction that would, would create a harmful environment that would require them to be taken away from general population for the safety of the staff and for the safety of the fellow residents. And that's why they're placed there. And, those, and the assessments take place at 72 hours, one week, one month to continue to examine the necessity for them to be there uh, in that restrictive um, housing environment. As I said, with males, it's on average um, eight and eight individuals of the 1700 are in that restrictive sort of status. And uh, the challenge we have is what happens when a resident stabs an officer? What happens when a resident stabs another um, resident? And what happens when this is, is a pattern of behavior? We have some residents at the Main State Prison that have um, are there for homicide, and then they've stabbed three people over time while in the Main State Prison. And so these are the people that are a challenge uh, to make sure that um, you know family members of other residents have the right to ensure that they are safe in that environment and in that in that uh, um, in that community while they're incarcerated. And I want my officers to go home at night. So those are the challenges and why people are in restrictive housing most often. Thank you. Um, are you all done, uh, Senator Sayway, with your questions? Well, I, I'd like to give the opportunity for the Sheriff Mason to answer that as well, because I, I know he was around during the Amhi days and, and uh, what he feels yeah. on resources. Um, well, thank you for dating me, Senator. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's just really a different time in corrections right now because, you know, we have a, a lot of people in our intake that, that do suffer from uh, severe mental illness and they're down there because we can keep an eye on them constantly um, with checks, making sure they're not harming themselves, making sure that we, you know, we try to get the, to their needs, little things. Um, and, and yes, we, we can have our own uh, mental health workers say, yes, you know, this person needs to be seen by a state mental health worker in regards to going to Riverview. And, and, and that can occur and it does occur. The problem is, is that the number of beds, it could be months 
before anybody gets there. So, you know, we're responsible for taking care of them. Uh, we take that responsibility seriously because we do understand uh, myself and my staff included, um, you know, because it's, there are times when it's a revolving door and the people are, are coming in that have been in there before and they've been, been found um, NCR, not criminally responsible. And which we understand. Um, and like the uh, commissioner said, you know, we, I want, I want myself and my staff, to everybody to do their jobs the right way, but go home. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will then ask um, Mr. Pelletier, you joined us. I don't know if we skipped over you. If you wanted to testify, I'll give you the opportunity. Uh, well, my understanding is we're on neither for nor against, and that's where uh, we are. We really didn't take a uh, position on the bill. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, John Pelletier, Chair of the Criminal Advisory Commission, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, but uh, we did want to point out that the, uh, the definition of solitary confinement needs work uh, because uh, from to our reading, it didn't, uh, it, it didn't really ban solitary confinement. Um, that, so the, um, you know, it says less than three contacts a day. Well, if contact includes walking by the cell door, calling out the prisoner's name and putting a meal tray through the door, that happens three times a day. And the person is not in solitary, even if they don't get out of the cell. So we need to need to work on the definition. And the, um, also, uh, just, you know, it's just technical stuff on, there's a the way the bill is drafted it has a definition in the prison statute 34a and in the jail statute 30a it has a reference to the prison statute you know but really what you want to do is you want to put the entire definition in the jail statute as well so that the the, the jail officials when they're looking at the law that governs them they don't have to do a side trip to title 34a to mm -hmm. see they, you want all of the law uh, there and then uh, the last technical technicality that was pointed out, I, I wasn't familiar with this, but someone chimed in that 30A calls the uh, residents inmates and 34A calls them prisoners. So you want to, uh, when you amend those statutes, you want to conform to that convention. With that, I'll <clears throat> answer any questions. And policy calls them resident, adult residents. So, uh, yeah, we'll get there. Um, thank you. Any questions of Mr. Pelletier? Um, thank you. Thank so you. I've done support and opposition. Um, I now just received a note that there are two people that wish to speak neither for nor against. And I will recognize um, uh, Ms. Drew. And then Ms. Collins, I believe. Now you haven't testified in this one, right? I mean, you testified in the other one. Okay, Correct. thank you. Go right ahead, Ms. Drew. I'm the, Janet Drew from York, Maine. I'm reading a letter from an inmate of um, Maine State Prison, and I, he's clearly uh, opposed to solitary confinement, as I'm, am I, but I think that the bill needed work, and that's why uh, I have us listed under neither for nor against. Here's his letter. Dear Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and Honorable Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee members. My name is Stephen Clark. I'd like to provide testimony for LD 676. I'm an incarcerated citizen at Maine State Prison. I'm certified as a substance abuse and mental health rehabilitation technician, a recovery coach. I'm currently in my third semester of graduate school studying psychology, spent my first semester researching mental health, peer support, and the harmful effects 
of imprisonment and segregation. Over the past nine years, the prison has allowed me to mentor, facilitate, and coach men at the prison, including men in segregation. None of the men I met were violent monsters or unredeemable. None were so out of control or violent that they should be locked up in a small six by eight room for 23 or 24 hours a day. Each of these men were looking for the same thing, connection and healing. All had experienced significant trauma in their lives and they needed love, human connection and support. In solitary confinement, men became paranoid. They were overwhelmed with stress, lost self-esteem and participated in self-harm or became suicidal. They're placed in small cells, often with nothing, not even a book. In some cases, the cells are in unsanitary, covered with blood and bod bodily fluids. An older gentleman who I lived with in the honor pod returned to the prison following a medical procedure and was required to quarantine in the segregation unit due to COVID pro protocol. He was placed in a cell with feces on the walls and still in the toilet and blood on the door of his cell. He requested cleaning supplies, but got none till the next day. The conditions of segregation would put an animal shelter out of business. Men are stressed and asking for help, but services in segregation are lacking. It's common for mental health professionals to miss appointments. A man sits all week waiting to see someone who doesn't show. They feel let down and angry. Many, many guards are professional and compassionate, but several others are abusive and enjoy provoking inmates. For example, refusing to provide toilet paper or banging on the doors to wake up men during rounds. If you put a plant in the dark, give it no sunlight and nutrients, it does not grow. Humans are similar in nature. Our ab ability to evolve requires positivity and a stable environment. Segregation creates an environment of digression and instability. It's a powerful example of warehousing human beings. We are taking broken people, placing them in segregation, separating them from connection. We over-medicate them, provide minimal services, then release them with no supports, a disaster. The prison has a 66% recidivism um, rate. Ms. Drew, yes? your time is up. If you could wrap up, please. Okay. I have one more par short paragraph. Go ahead. My, la my last attempt to mentor a young man in segregation unit named Zach was rebuffed. I don't know if it's the same Zach. I'm, t I'm saying that. I was told his behaviors did not match up with me being able to go down and support him. He had to behave first. I asked, when we're struggling, isn't that when we need the most support in our lives? The response? I don't know what to tell you. By supporting an end to segregation, you're supporting the well being of human beings and an end to unnecessary suffering and creating a safer Maine community. Thank you, Stephen Clark, Maine State Prison. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Uh, Drew? Seeing none, I will call uh, forward um, Jan Collins. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Jan Collins, and I am Assistant Director for Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition. I'm here to speak neither for nor against LD 696. MPAC is fully in favor of prohibiting solitary confinement, but believe that this bill needs additional safeguards. According to articles in the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law, Isolation can be as distressing as physical torture. We do not need journal articles to tell us this. COVID has taught all this lesson. Still, we continue to use isolation as the go-to discipline in prisons. Cloaked in new terminology, segregation, special management units, it continues to cause irreversible physical and mental harm, even death. The DOC has provided us with statistics that at best minimize the true impact of this practice of isolation. 
For instance, the graph showing average length of completed stay. An average means that people who have been in segregation one day are averaged with those that have been there for over a year. It also fails to capture those who may have been there 30 days, then out for five days and back in for two months. What we need to know is the cumulative stay for individuals. We need to know if an individual has spent four of the last six years in solitary. We need to have data on self-harm. How many attempted suicides? How many episodes of cutting? How many ended in blood transfusions? How many self-mutilated? How many banged their heads against the wall repeatedly? How many smeared feces in their own blood throughout the cell? Each of these is an extreme cry for help. Why are these men and women being returned to isolation after being rushed to the hospital? Why is medical advice being dismissed in favor of continued torture? Every condition in the DOC policy intended to ensure the safety of an individual in solitary can be overturned by some level of administration. There are no safeguards that are absolute and definitive. This needs to change. The research is clear. Confinement may make people incapable of living around other people. It also adds to memory, hallucinations, paranoia, poor impulse control, social withdrawal, et cetera. All of these are in direct opposition to the department's directive to rehabilitate and return inmates to the community successfully. There is a critical need for an ombudsman to evaluate the DOC's compliance with Americans with Disabilities Act and to ensure that healthcare needs are being met, especially in the area of mental health. In short, we need the same policy and corrections as in healthcare. Do no harm. Although we are grateful to the current administration of the Department of Corrections for the distance they have come, there is still a huge distance to go. I urge the committee to strengthen this bill and eliminate isolation in prisons. Thank you. And I'm certainly willing to take questions. Any questions? Seeing none. I don't see anyone else who wishes to speak neither for nor against. Um, <clears throat> you all know where I come from. I'm gonna take a moment that um, this is not easy for to listen. Um, I know many of the individuals that were named um, I also was thinking of the staff that deal with this day in, day out. They don't go to work every day to do harm. Um, I was thinking of the administration in a thousand inmates in a confined area with different issues, different needs, different wants. The staff, one day are law enforcement, one day they're ministers, one day they're mental health, one day they put a Band-Aid, one day they encourage them to have job training. To be a staff person in a facility such as a prison, prison, um, you have to be everything to everybody. Um, I am not excusing any behaviors. Some of the comments made were um, about 18 years ago, especially Main State Prison. There was a reason why that closed and it is no longer standing. Um, but having said all this, I am obviously in support of any review um, I don't know if it needs to be a statute. Um, this is a facility. There is an administration. There are reviews of policies. 
there are accreditation looking um, at policies. Um, so I am wide open to listen. Uh, and I hope you are also to listen and hear. Um, this is um, uh, very difficult. So um, having said that, I thank you for not stopping me. <laughs> and uh, we can proceed. And again, uh, Representative Lukna, I will personally tour you <laughs> for sure. Um, so we are done for today. Um, our next meeting is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Wednesday, um, the 7th. We begin at 10. We have five bills in the morning and two public hearings. They're all public hearings Wednesday. Um, and so um, we'll see you then. Does anybody have any comments to make or questions to ask? Seeing none. Thank you all and uh, hope you sleep well all. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.